Mr. Perkins? Here. Mr. Stevens? Here. Chairman Benson? Here. Mr. Williams? Here. And Ms. Campbell? Here. Perfect. Mr. Perkins has agreed to do the uh, invocation and lead the pledge, and we invite you to join us. Join us if you'd like. <laughs> Almighty God, thank you so much for allowing us to come and serve the people in such a beautiful area with wonderful natural resources and citizens who are hardworking, kind, and generous. Help us to do your will and to make the best use of the resources that we have at our disposal. Help us to treat others with respect, kindness, and love. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the Republic for which our nation Thank you, Mr. Perkins. Uh, we come now to the adoption of the agenda. And with your permission, I would like to move item 9C up uh, between items 5 and 6. I know there are a number of people here who are interested in that item. And rather than have them go through all of the other items on our agenda, which they're invited to stay for, by the way, um, we th thought we would handle that item first if there are no objective objections. If not, is there a motion to adopt the agenda as amended? I'll make a motion. It's been moved by Mr. Stevens. Um, I'm sorry. May, may I interject? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I've just learned uh, just now that Mr. Chambers uh, has is represented by counsel, and he wanted his uh, attorney to be here for this discussion, and his attorney is running late. Oh. I, okay. I, I, I advised right. him that might put him after the presentation, okay. however. But All so right, then okay. erase, erase my comment. Let's, uh, we'll take an, a motion for the agenda as printed. Uh, and Mr. Stevens, do you still move it? I do. Okay. It's been moved by Mr. Stevens, second by Ms. Campbell. Please vote. It appears to have passed five to five. I don't see it saying that. Okay. Um, the next item is public hearings, and there are none. Uh, the next item is open forum. Do we have anyone wishing to address us in open forum? Okay. Uh, we come now to presentations. Uh, the item is adoption of general resolution number GR 23-73, a general resolution for the selection of a consultant for the solid waste transfer station and maintenance building. And with that, we have a presentation by consulting firms. Uh, Mr. Woody, how shall we do this? Uh, I can give a brief uh, project overview, if, okay. that's, uh, if that would please the chairman, and then, uh, then we'll invite our uh, attendees to uh, make their presentations. Okay. Um, the purpose of this is for engineering services and architectural services related to construction of a solid waste transfer facility and maintenance building at the location of our current uh, Godwin, uh, Godwin and Pine Forest uh, sanitation facility. Uh, we have needs for both of these uh, projects for two separate reasons. Uh, the maintenance building is original to the property when we acquired it. Uh, was probably, <laughs> may have been decades old at the time we acquired it. Uh, and it's in very, very sad shapes and needs to be replaced. We're replacing it uh, in kind, uh, same footprint as existing. And then uh, the transfer facility <coughs> is to uh, allow us to take advantage of the efficiency created by having a, a relatively bit um, location for us to be able to get our route trucks back into service uh, more quickly 
and to instead uh, save that long, longer distance uh, travel uh, all the way to the uh, Perdido landfill. Efficiencies gained by that uh, will have benefits for our, our customers uh, ultimately. Uh, we received uh, um, uh, responses uh, to our request for qualifications, and as a result of that, uh, this afternoon there will be presentations by the following four firms listed in alphabetical order. They are Arcadis, uh, Jacobs, Jones Edmonds, and Mott McDonald. And I believe present already in the, um, in the room is uh, folks from Arcadis. And we'll have them make their presentations first. We've asked them to stay around 15 minutes and allow time for questions. Uh, and then we'll move on in alphabetical order from there. Okay. Thank you. And are, will all of them listen to each other's presentations, or will they be absent while the others are presenting? Uh, we've asked uh, the other three to uh, stay out in the hall and try to be respectful of the others. Uh, but at the same time, I have to admit this is a public meeting. We can't prevent them from, from doing that. But we've asked them to... Uh, Please honor our request. Okay, thank you. All right, so shall we call on the Arcadis group to, to go first? And please introduce yourself and... Uh, Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Is that all right from here? Okay, Good. great. So my name is Patrick Flannelly. Uh, first of all, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, Executive Director Woody, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Patrick Flannelly on behalf of Arcadis. I am the area leader for Arcadis, so I'm responsible for all the services that Arcadis delivers to municipalities and municipal utilities throughout much of the Southeast United States. I'm currently based in Birmingham, but I'm actually in Pensacola quite a bit, both on business and, and for vacation, because for years my family has believed that Pensacola Beach is the best beach on the entire Gulf. So. Uh, we have a particular affinity for this area. I've had the pleasure of working for ECUA um, directly on some projects uh, over the years, uh, most recently on your risk and resilience and utility-wide emergency response plans. Um, our local account lead, Pete McMaster, is actually overseas. He's uh, on a lifelong, once-in-a-time, once-in-a-lifetime trip with his family to Ireland. Uh, so apologies for him not being here today. But I will tell you, he called me from Ireland yesterday to make sure we were ready. So he's definitely uh, paying attention to it. So Pete will be a key person, you know, in the project for, for the delivery of it. Um, with me here today, I brought Steve Nesbitt, and we also have Tyler Noland. Steve is one of our national experts on solid waste. He knows a lot more about solid waste than I do. Um, so he's got 40 years of consulting experience, the last 32 um, specifically and uniquely in the solid waste area. So he is a solid waste professional, 32 years doing that and, and doing nothing else but that. And his particular experience is in municipal urban solid waste infrastructure development. So a uh, significant part we're going to deliver today in terms of our approach and, and how we would deliver for you is going to be delivered by, by Steve. I also brought Tyler. Tyler is our local liaison. He'll be a liaison coordinator in local permitting uh, on this project. Um, and so that's, that's the team that we brought to Madam Chair today. If we may, I, they gave me this uh, pointer. Hopefully I get this right. I'm not exactly sure where I point it. Oh, thank you for that. Appreciate it. So if we may, what Steve is going to talk to you about today is a quick summary of our project understanding. What do we understand your project is? And then he's going to talk about the, the success factors, right, the, the importance of having, you know, identifying early what success factors are and having solution elements in place that will help us navigate towards, that, towards success. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the evaluation criteria, but not a lot. Uh, and we'll do a quick summary and wrap up. I, I know that time is limited. Um, you know, if at, at any point you, you want to ask us questions along the way, feel free. I know there's time allotted at the end as well for, for Q&A, but really that's your call. All right. So... You know, the RFP has eight specific areas, criteria for evaluation. I'm not going to, you know them, right? They're in your RFP. Um, in the interest of time today, you know, we hit all of these, and our proposal talks about how we hit all of these. And if you've got questions on how we hit any of them, for, feel free to ask us. But for the purposes of the day, we're going to talk to you a little bit about our CADIS qualifications, and then we're going to talk about um, mostly C, specific firm capabilities. And we'll be talking about that within the context of our approach that we would recommend to make sure that you have a successful project. So 
quick self-serving 30 seconds, maybe a minute, to talk about Arcadis uh, before we really spend the rest of the time talking about you. Um, but we, we've been working in Florida for, for over 60 years. We have 270 professionals working in the state of Florida. We've been lucky enough to serve you all. We've been working for ECUA for, for quite a period of time. We've done a lot of, of work for you, a lot of water and wastewater work, and we've even done some solid waste work for you in the past. As it relates to solid waste, we've done more high-level solid waste consulting than just about anybody in the state of Florida. We've delivered over 500 projects in the past 10 years uh, with a capital delivery value of over $2 billion. Um, as it relates to urban municipal solid waste infrastructure, you know, we really follow the projects through the full life cycle, and we've worked on landfills, we've worked on transfer stations, we've worked on recycling stations, so all of that. And our office locally is, is really just down the road on Airport Road. So that's it from, uh, as it relates to Arcadis, uh, unless you all have any questions for us later. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Steve now. He's going to talk about what we understand your project to be and, and what we recommend as the approach to, to get you where you need to go. Thank you. When, when you uh, set the project up at the beginning, you talked about your goals and your objectives and trying to uh, take that waste stream from the unincorporated areas in the surrounding uh, uh, county and uh, consolidate that waste stream down to a central location, co-locating co your transfer station and the maintenance building with your existing operations center to create a new, a new integrated hub, and then taking that consolidated waste stream and shipping it via a fewer number of larger transfer trailers out to the Perdita landfill just off of I-10 inside, inside the county boundaries. And, and siting that transfer station and maintenance building uh, specifically with, within an existing urban area. And there are issues uh, that go along with, with doing that. We put them up on the screen. And what I'm going to spend the bulk of my time speaking about today is our approach to engaging with those issues and presenting what I would call the success factors of how we address each, each one of them in a way that allows the successful development of that transfer station and maintenance building. So why Arcadis? Because we deliver predictable, successful outcomes and, and predictable, success, successful development of uh, specifically of municipal transfer stations. Going from left to right, dealing with nuisance mitigation and setting a facility within an existing urban area and being a good neighbor in an urban setting. We would talk about measures and how we can address that issue and be successful in doing so. Proof of concept means, means capturing the various success factor, the things that are important to you as the owner and the operator, and making sure that we're doing the right project for the right investment, the right dollar investment that you're making. And design to budget and build to bid have to do with maximizing the value of that investment, or what you might call getting, getting the biggest bang for the buck. And then making sure we have effective cost control from the beginning of the project and managing the cost expectations as to what it's going to actually do, do to do the project properly. And then managing cost control all the way through concept, through operations and startup. And I'm going to address each one of those in order. We spoke about those four, the proof of concept, optimized performance, designed to budget and build to bid. And the understanding or the expectation is you're going to probably use a conventional permit, design, bid, build approach. There are other alternate delivery mechanisms available, but, but most likely looking at the project, probably most traditional design, bid, build. What's shown there on the slide are four photographs of where we've taken our approach and used it at other transfer stations and other compactor facilities around the country and my personal involvement with each one of those in addressing the operational requirements and the, and the abatement or mitigation of, of aesthetics or nuisance concerns. With regard to the urban setting, the attention to detail really matters in terms of abating and mitigating any concerns you have about nuisance or aesthetic impacts. One of the things that I've spent a lot of time in my career in doing is, is, is working on, on qualitative and quantitative health risk assessments and showing that we can, in fact, develop municipal solid waste infrastructure in an urban context. What I've listed up on the screen, going from top to bottom and right to left, are the different kinds of concerns that we have dealing with the visuals and the nuisance from the aesthetics and the technologies that we use dealing with visual aesthetics, traffic concerns, odor, dust, noise, and litter. And there are technologies which, we, which have been developed and which we use routinely in order to overcome those constraints and limitations and allow us to be successful. And showing up on the right-hand side of the screen are three projects where we've done it. 
conceptual design of the Rivanna uh, transfer station, a Packer station similar to one which you want to put in place and making that facility to blend in with its existing community. Doing the same with the Delaware, Milford, and Row 5 stations to make it aesthetically pleasing so it fits in. And what I put up on, on, the, on the screen there is a photograph of the, of the City of Virginia Beach Mount Trashmore Park. It's a project that I'm most proud of where we took a, a, a former facility that was actually closed, open dump, and actually retrofitted and rehabilitated so there are a million people a year that, 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 that visit that facility. I know it's not a transfer station, but it's a testimony of our ability to take something like a landfill and make it work within an urban context. And the other project I alluded to was the City of Virginia Beach Landfill Number 2 uh, in doing the full quantitative and qualitative health risk assessment associated with, a, with, a, with an expansion to put uh, 10 million cubic yards of additional airspace in place within an urban area with, with surrounding residential and, and urban development. Right? That next step we talked about was proof of concept. Proof of concept means capturing uh, the success factors or all those issues which are important to you to make sure that we're building the right project for the right dollar investment. It involves a, a creating an interactive financial uh, pro forma cost model where I can, I can then uh, calculate for you on your behalf what is the maximum budget, uh, permissible budget, uh, without being, while still remaining cost effective. So it's a proof of concept that, allow, that allows us to confirm that we're spending the right amount of money and making the right investment for you. And then design of budget is actually dialing in that design basis, again, using another pro forma model, creating financial models that show you what the cost of operating various uh, transfer facilities can be for various different kinds of configurations. Then knowing what that maximum budget is that we've, uh, that we've ascertained from the, the proof of concept, we can then carry it over to the right-hand side of the page, and I can tell you which design basis configuration gives you the maximum rated capacity and eff effectiveness for that transfer building. Right? So it goes nuisance, dealing with the nuisance issues, proof of concept to make sure we're spending the right amount of money for the right kind of facility, and then getting the biggest bang for the buck, again, through interactive pro forma modeling, really to help you get the best value for your investment. It sounds good. It sounds good. People say, show, you know, show me the money, but that's, that's the slide. That's the slide. It's seven projects that I've worked on personally. For the projects, the clients are listed, the project name. OPCC is the engineer's opinion of probable cost of construction. That's the engineer's estimate of what it would take to produce the project. The bid amount is the, is the responsive bidder at the bid opening. And the final amount is the contract amount at completion of the project and the final change order rate is calculated by the change between the bid and the final. The OPC and the bid are important. It shows that we're able to accurately estimate the cost of the project so you don't have an awkward moment when you open the bids and they exceed the engineer's estimate. Right? No one likes when that happens. And the bit, and then the final contract amount is a testimony to the quality of the work which we do. By producing amounts that are two to minus four percent, it means we're, we're completing projects of this nature which don't have change orders. We're not even using the additional quantities that we allocate in the in the bids. And that allows us to create projects with two to minus four to show minus four percent change order to show it graphically. There's a comparison our project data compared to industry standards, Army Corps of Engineer and US EPA with change order rates which are typically in the 5 to 10 percent and the projects are the right, on the right are the projects I've been involved with which shows those change order rates of plus 2 to minus 4. That avoided cost could be several hundred thousand dollars or up to half a million dollars. That's an avoided cost that you don't have to pay and it's money that can be invested back into your project or back into other ECU projects. Patrick, you want to take it? Yep, sure. So, we kept it short today. We really wanted to just come in and explain that, you know, our track record and methodology around transfer stations is one built on these four nuggets for success, these four success enablers. One is to make sure that with the urban setting that this transfer station will sit in, that it can be designed to be a good neighbor in that setting. Two is that we really base a proof of concept on capturing from you not only what your success factors are, but your priorities around those success factors. If two conflict, which ones are more important? And really getting down to make sure that we document on the front end 
what are the most important things to you and then use them to navigate the design and the implementation. And as Steve has said, it's around designing to budget, getting you the biggest bang for the buck within the design, and then cost and schedule certainty for the delivery of the construction um, in terms of being able to make sure that at the end of the project, it's done on time, it's done on budget, and it does what it says on the tin, it does what you need it to do. And with that, we'll invite any questions. Thank you, um, board members. Mr. Stevens. Uh, yes, sir. Is it No, I'm, I'm Steve. Yes, I'm, I'm going to be the project manager and the technical lead. It will go through a competitive procurement. Part of the part of the design process. Very important that the design process for the for these facilities is really built around the rolling stock of the equipment. So Mr. Krupa, who is in the proposal, is going to be the person who's actually going to be leading that, that task and, and engaging with the vendors. So when we get to the, when we get to the part of actually doing the, the detailed design, we are going to be having vendor engagement, and, and Joe Krupa will be involved in that, that part of it in, in talking about the rolling stock and the equipment, and that will feed up into the design project. But in terms of the awarded project, I'll be overseeing the construction aspects of it. Okay, and, 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 do, and do you all will you be utilizing local contractors well, it will uh, be, in house or it's going to be a competitive bid okay so it'll it'll it'll, it'll go to the, to the lowest qualified bidder okay that's all I had okay miss Campbell Yes. Yeah. Yes, York County, York County, Virginia, and and in, in uh, uh, Fort Myers in in Lee County on a very small footprint. There, there, there are there are suppression systems with misting and spraying that can both that can that can manage it. As well as as well as good housekeeping, good housekeeping is going to be important. Well, and you have to complete the operation at the end of every day and clean it up every night before you get, before you turn the lights out and walk away. Not and not really at a transfer station, right? Because the waste the waste is not left exposed. It's cleaned up. It's moved as it's brought in. It's put into the into the hoppers, and it's not going to be the issue. It's not going to be like if it's if it's a landfill, where you have open acreages of, of exposed waste. are 27 different ways to do it <laughs> there's that we, both and all from from being with with grade separation where the, where the, the smaller trucks the packer trucks come in on an elevated grade and then they will typically end up the front end loader will then push that waste into the into a hopper and the hopper will direct the waste into the truck below uh, you can have simply a gravity fed hopper or you can use a packer mechanism where, you, where the back end of the, of the truck is open, and then you have a hydraulic ram that then compacts that waste into the transfer trailer itself, and that's how you maximize the payload. Right? That's how you get from, instead of just hauling 15 or 20 tons out on the tracker truck, you can haul 25 or 30. So that's how you actually consolidate that waste mass and pack it into the back, so you reduce the number of trucks that are coming in and out of your facility. Well, or walking floor trailer, yeah, or a tipper, yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's part of proof of concept and, and understanding what your operational goals and objectives are and, and, and how, much, how much money you want to spend. Right? So like I said, there are, there's, there's 27 different ways to do it. 
but that proof of concept stage allows us to validate and confirm your assumptions and what it is you're trying to, to accomplish and achieve and how, to, and how to get the best value for you. That is debatable. <laughs> uh, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I see you are a local company throughout the state of Florida. Can you just tell me what kind of work you've done in Orlando? Um, so in Orlando, uh, most of the work that we do is municipal water and wastewater. So we've, uh, we work for a variety of entities um, in Orlando, in Tampa, in Jacksonville. Um, we do a variety, Arcadis has solid waste, water, wastewater, infrastructure, transportation uh, services. I would say throughout the state of Florida, we do all of them, but in the Orlando area specifically, I think it's more water, wastewater. Okay, thank you. Then secondly, as you go from, through this project, who will be responsible for training the ECUA employees to operate in this uh, new transfer station environment? My and my team will be. Okay. We can provide O&M support and operational training. There will be an operations plan, and we can work with your team to do that. Okay. Okay. Lastly, it, it's not. It may not be necessarily be me, but there there would be some. It could be someone like Joe Cooper or, or others on the team. Okay. Lastly, is is this company consist of only males? Your company. No. No, sir, um, that, that definitely not. One of the things I would tell you is that the quality assurance uh, expert on this project is Leah Richter. Leah Richter is a solid waste professional um, with many years of solid waste experience. She's in Palm Beach County, one of our largest solid waste clients. Uh, we understood we couldn't have virtual participants today. Um, so uh, we, we, we could have had her remotely, but uh, she is a strong member of this team and a strong leader at Arcadis. I didn't hear you the first time, but you said only males? Correct. No, the deputy project manager, Cindy Eckert, should be right hand. Cindy's okay. in the Tampa office. I work very closely with Cindy on projects around the country. So Leah and Cindy. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. By the way, board members, I have a way of clearing you after you've spoken. So if you want to speak again, you can just hit uh, uh, request to speak again uh, if this works. Uh, looks like it did. Ms. Campbell, you're recognized. Oh, I'm sorry. How will we address trash flying out of the truck that goes from the transfer station to the landfill? Is it an enclosed 18 wheeler? They, 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 they can be, they usually covered with a tarp. It depends, okay. it depends upon the type of equipment you want to use. The packer vehicles with the ram are totally enclosed. The gravity top are simply tarp covered. So again, it depends, it depends upon the payload you're trying to achieve and the type of equipment that you're using. Thank you, and th thank you very much for answering those questions. Uh, and if I might as well, you always get my attention when you talk about aesthetics, and ECUA deals with things that are not inherently aesthetic, as right. you can imagine, right. although um, Mr. Piscopo would argue that lift stations are very beautiful. <laughs> um, so uh, caring about aesthetics, it, it, it matters, and I want you to give some examples of how you overcame challenges of aesthetics, but I'm also tight-fisted, too. I, we don't want a sculpture gallery in front of this thing. H how do you do good aesthetic design on a budget? Well, there, there's, uh, there's three examples up on the screen. Yeah, and I couldn't uh, see them Top, well. top to yeah. bottom, right? And, and we work with the landscape architect uh -huh. at Ellie as part of the team. So the Rivana station, the Packer station on the top, the concern was fitting in with, with at that point, was, was, was a, a, a rural environment. So they wanted it to have the same look as the surrounding community. So we worked with a landscape architect in developing line of sight analyses and developing a structure that was aesthetically pleasing that matched the surrounding terrain and topography and, and, and the buildings itself. The, the Delaware Authority had, looks like a, a, a red barn because if you go through the Delaware countryside, that's, that's what that's what, you, that's what you see. So again, working with an architect, there's landscape architects and architects on the team. 
And Trashmore Park was working with, with, with an architect. We took a site that, that was classified as an open dump and closed to the, and it was not, not pretty, and took that to a point where there are a million people a year visit that facility. And again, working with the architectural team. I will tell you, I was born in Milford, Delaware, and the, you're right about the red barns. It fits in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things we've done, and we did, we did it for other sites as well, is you can actually do an animated drive-by. You can actually show, using, using 3D rendering, you can actually show a drive-by of what it will look like. Uh -huh. And then we have photographs afterwards, we've completed it, and showing a video driving by, you, you can match them up, and they, they look pretty much the same. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Campbell, you were finished, were you not? But you <laughs> yeah, and Mr. Williams, you were finished as well. Um, I had you have another one. Up. Yes, okay. ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. The question would be: How long do we project the, the transfer station to to last to be in operation? You can design for a 20 to 30 year lifespan. Most of them go well beyond beyond their design lifespan, but you can plan on a minimum of 20 to 25 years. So we're planning on a minimum of 20 to 25 years. You'll probably get more out of it than that. How much more? <laughs> how much? It depends upon how much you're willing to spend in building into the structure. I'm, I mean, based upon the scope of the work that we're talking about here. We, we can design a facility that can provide you a minimum of 25 years. Okay, all right, and, thank and, you. And, and, and if you want, depending upon the cost constraints, right, you can spend more and make the structure stronger and more robust. You can put more money into the pavements, more money into the, into the, into the, into the, into the tipping floor itself, and you can make the structure last longer. But it's a question of the investment. And we considered hurricanes? The, the, the structure will be designed to resist hurricane load, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Williams. I see no more questions, so I thank you very much for your presentation, and uh, we will go to the next presenter. Thank, thank you. you all. I really appreciate it. We've enjoyed working with you over the years. And I think Jacobs is going to be next. Is that correct? Have we given them a time, uh, a suggested time amount, Mr. Woody? Uh, what's been suggested is 15 minute presentation, 15 minutes for follow up okay. questions. Okay, good. Thank you. So, good afternoon. And um, if you'll introduce yourself and be recognized. Uh, yes, ma'am. Scott Jernigan, Jacobs Engineering out of Pensacola. I have with me Ken Dane and Bo Bruner. You may go ahead. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> well, again, uh, first, thank you for the opportunity to come and present today. Uh, we're going to talk for a few minutes about the solid waste transfer station and the maintenance building. Um, again, I'm Scott Jernigan with Jacobs Engineering. So today, a few things we want to talk about. Uh, we want to talk about our team and some of our experience, uh, particularly a couple of projects that are very similar to the RFQ that you have. Um, we want to talk about some key items that we think will make this program <coughs> successful. You know, some, <coughs> some questions of why Jacobs. So we want to talk about the existing plan that the staff has put together. We want to look at the compactor evaluation, um, check out some of the equipment that they have already reviewed, uh, validate and research what's, what's already been proposed. And we want to talk about permitting, you know, specifically DEP and Escambia County. Uh, and then that will roll right into a, a public outreach discussion. You know, what level of public outreach, if any, is the board interested in for this project? Um, finally, we want to talk about operation of the facility and safety. You know, what items can we design in to <clears throat> make sure that the folks that work there are, are safe on a day-to-day -day basis? Lastly, uh, a little bit of comment on schedule, some discussion there, and then we'll open it up to questions. So, uh, team and experience. Um, I think it's important to note here that over the last 15 years, we've got over 30 transfer stations and nine of them in Florida. You know, very similar in scope to what we're talking about here today. Um, as we noted just a minute ago, I'm um, Scott Jernigan. I'll be the project manager for this job. Uh, we have Ken Dane with us. Ken's our senior structural engineer. He leads structural engineering for us for the southeast. Um, and his background, he has a lot of experience in material handling facilities. So 
heavy floors, heavy foundations, push walls, heavy equipment, very similar to what we'll be talking about with this type of facility. Um, we also have Bo Bruner. Bo is going to be our solid waste subject matter expert for this project. Um, if you had the opportunity to flip through our SOQ, uh, we did provide an org chart. I uh, also wanted to note that our Pensacola office will lead this effort, and civil, transportation, stormwater, building mechanical, and structural will all be handled out of Pensacola. <clears throat> so, uh, a little bit of information about me. Um, again, local project manager. Um, some background that I have specifically with ECUA in the solid, wor solid waste arena. Excuse me. Um, I was a project manager for MRF several years ago. Um, I was the project manager for composting for the initial phases of that project. Um, I did the design for the truck scales at CWRF, and you know, the, that equipment has been um, integrated directly into the septage receiving program. And then finally, I was a project manager for the uh, generator maintenance building, and <coughs> excuse me, worked with uh, Mr. Piscopo on that one. So um, some of our experience we want to talk about. Two projects that we've highlighted that are very similar in scope to the transfer station we have proposed today. Um, the first one's the McLeod Road Solid Waste Station. And this is in Orange County, down in Orlando. Um, it's a 62,000 62, square foot facility. It includes a maintenance shop. Um, it includes a scale house and a transfer station. And this one was interesting because it also included demolition of the existing facility. Uh, another component that is, that is uh, proposed for this site. Um, and you know, getting into the, the weeds just a little bit, this is one of those areas where we want to look at if we're building on top of existing foundations, what do we have to note on settlement, differential settlement, what conditions underlying that we need to take into account to make sure that this building is built the right way. Um, <clears throat> so lastly, this was, a, uh, it was about a $27 million project, and it was finished just two years ago. Uh, a couple things that we want to highlight here also, uh, if you note the project team, Bo was the uh, subject matter expert lead on that. And <clears throat> you'll notice consistency in our design staff. So that group works together regularly. You know, our architects, our engineers, our mechanical guys, you know, they've built the relationship. They know how to design these projects and develop them successfully. The next example we want to talk about is McKay Bay. Uh, this was for the city of Tampa. It's a 40,000 square foot facility, two story. Again, very similar to what we're talking about here for ECUA. Um, it did include, you know, an employee administrative area, new parking, um, and then this one also included some SCADA and instrumentation. So, you know, what level of monitoring do you want for the operators in a control room? Does that need to be reviewed somewhere else? What level of security do you need for the site? Um, are we talking cameras with remote monitoring? You know, these are things that we'll want to discuss during our preliminary design phase to see what needs to be integrated into the project. Um, this project was about a $36 million job and it was finished last year. Uh, again, going back to the team, you see several, several names that have been repeated a couple times, and Bo was the leader on that one. <clears throat> All right, so we noted uh, earlier that there were several key things that we wanted to focus on for this project. Um, as we get to the Q&A, we're happy to talk about you know, design submittals and design practice and 306090 submittals, any of that, but we thought these items were a little more pertinent to today's discussion and you know, this is something that we think will help make the total program successful. You know, we want to do more than just design and build this. We want to make it a life cycle opportunity. So if there's an opportunity to help with <coughs> the operations plan, um, rate evaluations, public outreach, we want to make sure that's all incorporated up front. So the first thing we want to touch on is the existing plan. Um, staff has already put some effort into this. So you've got a, <coughs> excuse me, you've got a preliminary footprint. You've got some proposed equipment. Um, you know, we know that the that staff has, has reviewed equipment already. Um, we've reached out to the city of Pensacola and talked to them about their uh, compactors they have downtown. So we want to validate some of that exercise that's already been done, make sure we're not recreating the wheel, uh, and keep the project moving forward. So we also want to talk about permitting. So permitting can have a big impact on the overall project schedule. Uh, FD, def, excuse me, FDEP can have a long lead time. So we want to meet with them early you know, identify our program, ask them, hey, what are you looking for in a submittal? We want to make sure that we get all the boxes checked as early as we can so that we're not impacting the ready for bid, plan set, <coughs> excuse me, and construction start. Um, we also want to talk to Scambia County. You know, we will have to do a development order for this submittal. And this is where the neighborhood folks are going to get involved. This is where we'll look at the stormwater, the traffic, uh, potential odors. So, you know, all that will be you know, combined into a submittal to them. 
And this is where we want to communicate with you, know, you, the board and staff, and say, hey, what, what type of public outreach would you like? Anything here? Are you interested in fact sheets and talking points? So when residents ask you questions, you can provide information. Or do you want to go with more of the, <coughs> excuse me, the town hall setting like we did for CWRF or Pensacola Beach Reuse several years ago? Um, that, that's just a question that we'll want input from, from the board on. Um, <coughs> next item we've got is operations. Uh, you know, I want to mention, we operate utilities, including solid waste facilities. So we have the guys that actually drive the trucks. So as we're working through the facility, we can help with an operations plan. We can help with rate studies. <coughs> you know, what is the impact going to be to the customer? Is that information that you need? Is it information that staff has already done and you, you'd like some background on it or some extra validation? We can handle that. Um, the, you know, the other thing that's part of that is, what new equipment, if any, will you have to buy? Are you going to have to buy new trailers to transport from the transfer station to the landfill? What does that look like? And finally, <coughs> we're going to talk about the safety. So this facility is going to have heavy equipment moving around all day, uh, mechanical equipment that's moving pieces. You know, we want to make sure the folks that come to the facility and work day in and day out go home safely at the end of the day. Uh, Jacobs has a very robust safety program. So we keep that in our operations world. You know, in our design world and on the construction side. Last thing we're going to talk about for just a minute is the schedule. So we think this is about a two-year project. Um, what we really want to focus on, though, is what are the options we have to accelerate the schedule or you know, hit deliverable dates that you guys have in mind. Um, the first thing we mentioned already, let's do an early equipment procurement package for the compactors. We can identify that equipment, select them, advertise and purchase. So we get the time saving on the schedule and the tax savings through the procurement. Uh, <coughs> we also run, want to run concurrent permitting schedules. Let's get to a 60% level where we have a good foundation of what the project's going to look like. Meet with DEP, get the permit application submitted. Meet with Escambia County, get the permit application submitted. So as we're working to 90% status, that process is running concurrently. Finally, once we get a construction, you know, what are the things that we can do to speed that up? Are there early works packages we can put together? Um, can we go ahead and advertise a demolition and site clearing package? Can we do stormwater and earthwork early? Um, you know, what, is, what does the building look like? Is there an opportunity to pre-procure the building if we're going, say, metal building? These are all things that we want to review with staff to say, hey, here's what our total project schedule looks like, and here are opportunities to compress that schedule. So. That's the main things I want to talk through today. Okay. Thank you, and any questions? And we do. Ms. Campbell, you're recognized. Site plan, all Very similar, yes, ma'am. Site plan. How is the appraisal going to be done? Oh, you want to take that one? Uh, we've used containment within the building itself. Uh, we've used roof fans on the on the roof for exhaust fans, which dissipate the odor. We've also put in uh, mechanical uh, odor control systems. Birds. Birds are an issue. Uh, there are things that you can do to keep them off equipment, like put spikes and stuff on them. Uh, for the city of Key West, we did one with rapid open doors and close. The only time the facility is open is when a truck's going in and out. That facility was right next to the Naval Air Station. The ones that I've had experience with have been what, what we call a, the, the pit type or tra a trailer type where you push into an open pit and it drops into the trailer. Uh, the one at Key West was actually done with an over the wall load using a front loader because of the elevation requirements there. Yeah, well, I could imagine. <laughs> yeah.
that's kind of what we thought with the, the neighborhood there and everybody thinks traffic's coming. You know, what can we do to mitigate those discussions? Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. So you've done work in Tallahassee, Florida? Uh, I personally have not. Have you worked in Tallahassee? I see you uh, have a local office in Tallahassee, so. Oh, we uh, do, yes, sir. We do transportation work out of Tallahassee. But I guess the big thing, you've done a transfer station in Orlando, you've done a transfer station in Tampa. Uh, what were the major differences between those two? Or were they basically the, the same? The technology was the same. Uh, the foundations geotech varied from site to site. Uh, the sizes varied depending on the waste loads. And the one we did in Key West was a very small station, like 300 tons a small, day. It was smaller in Key West? Key West is small, yes, okay, compared okay. to the others. Okay, thank you. You, you keep referring to your Key West um, uh, transfer station. Particular reason, I mean, were you the lead on that or is that like? Uh, actually that was done as a design build and I was the city's representative and we did the criteria package. Okay. Uh, the reason I mentioned it was the, the bird issue and then the size is similar to the one you have here. Okay. Uh, so ECUA employees, once you all leave, will they be, how will they be equipped to operate this, this facility? Um, so I think there's a number of ways we can do that. Uh, we can assist with an operations plan. Uh, we can do training. Um, Ms. Benson, do you remember the training we did for CWRF for all the various components through there? We can put together a component plan like we did there. Um, we can do safety trainings, uh, safety overviews. You know, our, our goal is, you know, once we're finished, it's an ECUA project. But again, you know, we want to we want to be able to to work through the life cycle of the project, not just a turn the keys over and walk away. How'd you do it in Orlando and Tampa? They were uh, both operating transfer stations there, so their operations staff was involved in the design, what they preferred to see, how they wanted to operate the facility. Okay. And how long do you expect this transfer station to, to last, the life cycle of this transfer station? The types of facilities we're building, uh, 30 to 40 to 50 years. And you're saying based upon the diagrams or based upon this project, the RFQ, you're expecting this project to last 30 or 40 years? The major components of it, I mean, some of your steel structure and things like that might have to be replaced, but your concrete components and the, the building itself and the infrastructure should. Your, we're compact, your compactors, of course, would need replacements periodically. And how about withstanding the hurricanes? Uh, we design them typically for whatever the hurricane zone is. Sometimes we go in excess of that. We've done them for, I believe, 155. And this particular building? Uh, Scott, I'll let you answer. So I, I think that's a question we want to answer from the border firm staff. Um, at the admin building at CWRF, CWRF, excuse me, I can't talk, CWRF, we did go above the published hurricane standards. It is a critical facility. So if that's, you know, it's a discussion we have to have that if wind loading here is 160 miles an hour and it's X dollars to go to 170 mile an hour, it's X dollars, where is the best fit? for ECUA at that price point. Okay, thank you. Last question, Madam Chair. Is this an, is this an all male, all men's organization or, or company? No, sir. Uh, our, uh, our team, we, we tried to pick some local folks to come and present today, and we wanted our solid waste subject matter expert. Um, our deputy PM that's proposed in our work chart, uh, she's female. We have, we, we try to have uh, a cross section of folks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, I, I like your uh, emphasis on schedule and maintaining good schedule on the projects that you have done so far. Have you b completed on schedule and um, within the budget? Are there change orders? What, what's your experience with budget and schedule? 
Um, I'll start that and let Bo provide a little more uh, clarity. So right now in our current market, um, we're, we're making the best educated guesses we can. Um, you know, delivery times are changing daily. Uh, electrical gear is, is long lead. Um, you know, we just finished the upgrade to lift station 285. We ordered that electrical gear in November of 21, and it came in two months ago. So when we have variability like that, you know, we want to try to build in some buffer, you know, but be intelligent about it. We don't want to come and put a four-year construction duration in the contract for this. You know, we want to identify what's, what's right for this type of construction, get with a contractor, have him provide, you know, POs and order dates and shipment dates so that if material prices change or delivery schedules change, we have a basis to come back and say, hey, th this is fair. It's what we're seeing in the industry. You know, what do you think about this change? I appreciate your candor in that answer because I know it's not the answer you truly wanted to give, but we all are facing that reality in al almost every bid that we see. So I, uh, I think it's, it's important that I can expect candor for, from you. Um, I appreciate your emphasis on safety. I think that's very important in the, the people we manage and what we do. And I, um, I, do you have a landscape architect? And you did say you have an architect. Are they part of your firm or do you uh, sub that out? Yes, ma'am, we have both. Um, our architect, uh, right now our proposed lead architect is uh, Adam Dolsack. He's out of Gainesville. Um, you'll notice he's been involved in several of these transfer pro uh, station projects. And then uh, landscape architect, we have three or four that we use pretty regularly along the Gulf Coast. So we can, we can determine what your landscape goals are there and grab the one that fits the best. Okay. And, and, and some of these, I would hope you would drive rather than us having to articulate some of these things. And yes, uh, so what can I expect in terms of vision from you? How would you like this facility to look and to fit in with its neighborhood? Because when you go out to the public, that's what they're going to want to know. Do you, do you have an overriding philosophy about how these things fit into their context? You want to start with that one? Yeah. That's really the job of our architects. And we have typically uh, looked at the neighborhood. We usually try to make them look from the exterior like a uh, more like a commercial building than an industrial building. We've used things like form liners and things like that on the wall that uh, give it the commercial, uh, you know, res commercial type facility as opposed to industrial. Um, okay, and that's all from me. Ms. Campbell, you had another question. Um, you're talking about the um, office. sanitation office building. You, you've been in the front office mm -hmm. building. I don't know that you've been in the storage and parts maintenance building that's behind it. Uh, night and day different. Uh, the office building that you're familiar with, I don't know exactly. This, I think we built that after we owned the building, after we owned the property. Um, but the building we're talking about replacing was owned by the previous sanitation company that was on the property. Uh, it has a lot of age. In fact, it, even if it had some interior partition and dividing walls are very questionable. We've actually roped them off and, and don't walk through those spaces. It, it, it's in sad shape. Well, even the office part is Um, you know, that's a question. We had, given the limited budget, we saw the priorities as, yeah. as the other, so we, we didn't budget yeah. for the. We might just find out how much yeah. more it would cost us to bring them up to date. Yeah. 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 That, that, that was one of the big things that we had to do is we had to do it on the day. Well, and I think. To kind of address that line of discussion, you know, to what Scott had mentioned during the presentation, you know, we, we welcome the opportunity to, you know, partner with you guys to evaluate. You know, you have some existing structures there. 
does it make the most sense to completely scrap and start new, or are there opportunities to, you know, utilize some of what's there already and save some cost or schedule and, you know, come up with the right solution long term and, you know, what fits within in the budget for the ratepayers and, you know, to so that project comes out the way the way everybody envisions. Thank you. And I see no more questions, so thank you very much for for your presentation, and we will continue the process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And what is the third one, Mr. Woody? I know um, Mark McDonald jo is fourth. Jones Edmonds. Jones Edmonds. Jones. Jones Edmonds. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Mont McDonald is the fourth one. Jones Edmonds, this is the third one. Okay, and you are recognized, so you may proceed with okay, your presentation. You. Good afternoon, directors. Uh, in 1992, uh, Jones Edmonds submitted on an RFQ to, to NASA at Kennedy Space Center for a landfill closure. You know, at the time, we didn't know anyone at NASA. We had never worked for NASA, and we didn't have a Titusville office at the time as well. But what we did have was great qualifications and great people that could do a, a landfill closure project. Why do I tell you this story today? Because I think we could start a story with ECUA in the same way we did with NASA. <clears throat> My name is Ken Vogel. I am the managing director of civil environmental at Jones Edmonds, and I would be the project manager on this project. I've worked my career at Jones Edmonds for 36 years on similar projects, uh, civil and, and environmental solid waste projects. On my leadership team, I have Rich Kohler, Rich Cole has worked by my side for 25 years uh, as a civil engineer, and he would be QAQC on this project. Also on the, my leadership team is Alan Altman. Alan's a newbie on our team. He's only been with us for four years, but the 30 years prior to that, he was the uh, solid waste director at Clay County, where we were working for at the time, and, and still work for, actually. Um, his knowledge of transfer stations and MRFs and maintenance buildings are invaluable to all of our clients in Florida and especially will be on this project. I'm Mark Hadlock. I've been with Jones Edmonds for more than 30 years. I'm a senior engineer in the solid waste group and I bring uh, a knowledge, in-depth knowledge of solid waste and how that relates to the facility. And uh, the, the group that I work with has an average of 20 years with our company. So we have a lot of continuity within our groups. My name is Brian Thomas. I've been with the company for 10 years. I'm a uh, project engineer in the civil design group. Good afternoon. My name is Jimmy Penley, and I represent the Lungs Group for the architecture and interior design. I would be the project manager for this project, and I would also be the point of contact for the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection, and structural. Uh, now, Jimmy and I wanted to give you a little bit of background about Jones Edmonds and the Lunds Group. Uh, Jones Edmonds is a Florida-based, Florida-focused firm. We focus our clients on cities, counties, and utilities throughout the state. U utilities just like yourselves. Uh, GRU in Gainesville, uh, Toho in, in the Orlando, St. Cloud area, and FGUA. Jones Edmonds focuses on three main disciplines. Infrastructure, which is our water, wastewater, collection, distribution, and treatment. Our water resources group, which is, focuses, focuses in on water quality, water quali quantity issues like watershed management, uh, wetlands uh, treatment, uh, resiliency studies, and it also includes our GIS and asset management team. 
And finally is our civil environmental group, which Brian uh, just kind of mentioned. Uh, the civil group include, uh, does our roadways, our site development, as well as some of our bigger stormwater projects. And then, uh, and then also, and of course, is our solid waste group in our civil environmental group. That uh, solid waste has been a core service of Jones Edmonds for 40 years, and that is something that we really excel at. And now Mark will tell you, oh, no, Jimmy, Jimmy will talk about the Lunds group. Um, just to give you a little insight on the Lunds group, we're a Florida-based firm. We've been in practice for 35 years. We currently have 55 experienced team members. Um, we have a vast amount of experience with maintenance structures, maintenance buildings, and transfer stations. Um, one, one other note is we've been currently working with Jones Edmonds for about nine years now, and we've <clears throat> successfully completed and designed multiple, multiple projects. Um, looking at some of the bottom images there, the one all the way to the left is a fleet maintenance facility. Uh, the one in the middle is a maintenance building for that we just actually got completed with r and in, in Ocala. And then the final one is the actual service pits uh, in the maintenance building. Jones Edmonds has clients all over Florida, essentially from one end uh, of the state to the other. And it's routine and normal for us to travel to these uh, sites away from Gainesville on a day's notice. It's, it's just what we do. And to go through some of these, Sarasota and Collier County are, are, are basically equal distance uh, as it is way out here to Pensacola, although it's easier to get out here because there's not nearly as much traffic as going to South Florida, mm -hmm. which we appreciate. Um, but the point being, uh, down in Collier County, we have a new scale house, we have a, a recycling facility going in, and this is repeat business. I think Ken mentioned that 85% of our work is repeat business. And that includes uh, working for Escambia County. We've done a tremendous amount of work out here for the county out at the landfill. So as we go up the state, uh, the figure shows where we've done different projects. And specifically for me, I've worked in Marion County for an 18,000 square foot transfer station that's under uh, major renovation right now. I just finished a transfer station in Alachua County where the whole floor was replaced, a high performance floor topping, about $2 million. It came in uh, on schedule and under budget, which is uh, pretty spectacular. So uh, we're able to respond to our clients and um, take care of what needs to be taken care of. Oh, I stay up for another one. Um, just a little bit about our experience <laughs> in Escambia County. In 2003, we had our first continuing services contract with Escambia County, and I was primarily the project manager um, for the duration of the contract, although it's, it's continuing to go on right now. And during that time, we did more than 50 projects, primarily at the Perdido landfill, totaling more than $25 million in construction. The most recent project was the current cell that's being used for disposal. I believe that's where all the waste from ECUA ends up going. So we have a, uh, a beginning to end overview of how solid waste works within the county. And transfer stations kind of cross the line between facilities and uh, mechanical disciplines and solid waste. And, and uh, what I and our solid waste groups brings to it is a, uh, a point of convergence for all of those disciplines. Now, now we want to spend the rest of our time talking about some of our recent uh, successful projects. Uh, the first one we want to talk about is the Walton County Transfer Station. The video is not working. But, uh, so the Walton County Transfer Station is an 18,000 square foot s facility. It, it, um, it, it's made for about 200 tons per day, which is what the county does. This was about a $5, five million facility in, in 2019. Jones Edmonds did all the site work, the grading and drainage, uh, the roadways, as well as ut utilities. When we designed this originally, we designed it as a split level to where we had put uh, tilt walls um, with a 60-something 60, 60 thousand square foot uh, push floor. Um, and I apologize, we had a video I was going to walk you through the building. Um, but the trucks will come into the back side of the facility. The front loaders will pick up the solid waste, dump it over the tilt wall um, into the trucks, and the truck continues on our way. So it's, it's a kind of a uh, continual motion. So you'll have trucks lining and running, and then the back loaders dumping and filling the, the waste. Now we'll talk about the Brevard County Transfer Station and Scale House facility. 
This project's anticipated to go out for bid in October of this year. I was the lead designer on this project. It consists of several new facilities on site, including a new transfer station, a new scale house, and an expansion to the county's existing mulching facility. One of the primary design considerations on this project was traffic routing on site and ensuring a, a uh, efficient traffic flow around the facility itself. At the, looking at the floor plan on this, this was the other type of- Hey, will you come up to the microphone to make I'm sure we, we, we want to um, hear every word. This, uh, this model or typology of the transfer station compared to the Walton County, the Walton County had a split level where there was not two stories. This is a push pit layout where the trash will come into the upper floor, uh, be pushed forward back loaders directly down into the actual trucks waiting. We also incorporated compactors and balers into this one. Um, the, but the two main tunnels, if you look at the elevations off to the, off to the right, um, you'll see the two, two tracks where the trucks come in, um, the trash is dumped down in and they continue motion out. I just want to add, th this facility is, a, is about 18,000 square feet. And it's for, uh, they want about 150 tons per day to go through it. And it's right now estimated at an $18 million facility. Now we have the Pasco County Scale House. The construction was completed on this project in 2021. I was the lead designer and engineer of record on this project. It consisted of the addition of two new scales to an existing scale house facility, as well as relocation of a third scale on site. It had new bypass lanes added and traffic routing around the site as a whole. One of the primary focuses of this project was the development of a comprehensive construction phasing plan, ensuring full operation of this facility during construction. I'm gonna walk you through the floor plans on it. Um, looking at the enlarged plan, this uh, scale house was set up with two working stations and two operable windows that would reach out onto the platforms. Uh, we also designed a, a full service kitchenette with a complete 100% ADA compliant bathroom. Um, the whole facility, the whole scale house, I'm sorry, was set up for ADA compliancy with ramps and met all of the codes on it. Um, looking at the image down, scale house with scales, that's showing the comparison of the floor plan to the scales. And the coordination in there was, was pretty intense because they were trying to do a phasing to where it, it would stay operational um, and complete the other construction at the same time. Um, looking at the exterior elevations, you can see the comparison of the overall canopy to the scale house. And the main thing in there is we're in Florida, it's very, very hot like today, um, and the rain. So keeping people under this umbrella while we're doing business and transferring solid waste, that was a main intent on this project. I would like to highlight a few of Jones Edmonds projects. This is the City of Tampa Solid Waste Facility Relocation. We are currently at 90% design. I'm the lead designer and engineer of record on this project. It consists of a large campus, including a new administration facility, new parking garage, new fleet maintenance building, a new car wash, truck wash facility, and a new container maintenance facility on site with the existing transfer station that they have. The primary design considerations on this site, again, are traffic routing, ensuring uh, efficient operations, as well as new utility design, including a large new lift station and several thousand feet of new utilities, water lines, sewer lines, and reclaimed water lines. Next, we have the NASA shuttle landing facility redevelopment. This project is currently in construction right now. It is a massive site design project consisting of miles of roadways, utilities, and hundreds of thousands of cubic yards of earthwork. This project is uh, a redevelopment of the land around the runway that NASA used to land the space shuttles on into a commercial spaceport. Excited. I'd like to go through some of the projects that Jones Edmonds, Jones Edmonds and I <clears throat> and the Lunds Group has done together as far as transfer stations and maintenance structures. Um, and this has been over the last nine years. 
Uh, we originally did a Polk County Central Water Production Plant, um, which, in, which had a overall maintenance building, office building, and what we did is we brought 12 different entities into one central location. Um, we just finished up with the dock house uh, at NASA. This was probably one of the longest projects for about a 200 square foot building I've ever worked on in my whole career. Um, we also did the pump house facility and then the VAB is the large NASA building where they actually, the vehicle assembly building. Some of the other structures that the Lunds Group has completed was RNL trucking maintenance, CSX intermodal, uh, Sumter County, we have a, a vast amount of experience with maintenance buildings. Um, and one of the uh, other elements is before I came into my architectural career, I spent about 20 years as a mechanic. So having the knowledge of the inner functions of a maintenance building compared to designing them, it was a very nice uh, interwoven once I, once I made full circle on that. Um, this image here is the is the RNL carrier maintenance facility. They built a hundred thousand square foot terminal dock terminal and a sixty thousand square foot maintenance building. The image at the bottom of the page is their maintenance. It had eleven bays, two truck pits, a full uh, functioning office, break room, restrooms, um, and then up on the top uh, right hand corner is the uh, trucking terminal. One hundred and eighty uh, truck dock doors, massive, massive facility. And then on the left-hand side is uh, the overall plan of the maintenance building. Jones Edmonds and the Lunds Group are Florida-based and Florida-focused. We have the necessary uh, staff and the expertise to provide all, uh, all the disciplines on this project and make, make it successful for you. We are a cohesive team that Jimmy said, we've worked together for nine years on very similar projects and numerous successful uh, maintenance uh, facilities like this one. Uh, we look forward to working with you and uh, starting a whole new story together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Williams, you have a question. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I heard you mention Clay County, uh, and I see on your map that the facility is closed, that the work you did there is, is finished or is there a facility that you, that you built in Clay County? We show the closure in Clay County of the landfill itself. There's still a, an MRF and two transfer stations operating out there and we're currently in the process of doing upgrades to the MRF, primarily structural related work at the landfill, uh, we call it the landfill, the Rosemary Hill site. Where is the transfer station located in Clay County? It's at the Rosemary Hill landfill. Okay. Basically, basically it's in Green Cove Springs. Oh, I'm sorry. Green Cove Springs. Springs. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. And then in uh, Tampa, you're just 90% on the design of a project there. Where is that located? That, that's pretty much downtown Tampa. Downtown. Uh, it's, it's called McKay Bay. Uh, it's just, it's like a little uh, peninsula right off downtown area. Okay. Um, yeah, we're working with Cocalacus contractors. Actually, they're the ones who built the Walton County Transfer Station, mm -hmm. and we really meshed with them very well, so we're on their design build team, so we're doing the site civil design work, and then they have two or three architects doing all those buildings that, um, that Brian mentioned. Okay. Uh, if I can divert, Mr. Woody, when we're talking about the transfer station, we're also including the building design with this discussion. These people will also build the building in addition to the transfer station? Uh, these are design services. Uh, certainly we might talk about different vehicles for providing that. This is essentially for design services for not only the transfer station, but also our um, maintenance and storage building. Okay, okay, that's what I want to be clear on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, Ms. Campbell? Yes, we did the, the length of our contract? Yes, ma'am. I worked on those two projects. We uh, set up the criteria for the landfill mining and it was bid out, but then there was the active gas collection system that fed the uh, Gulf Power project yeah. as well. Yes, ma'am. That's a phenomenal job you yes, did out there. Um, I have a few questions. Um, I see that you, you built some this size. It looks like the one, the one in Brevard is about this size, but have you ever built any in like an, an area like ours, like this little 
urban area close to homes and such? Uh, yes, yes and no. I mean, uh, most of the facilities do have a fair amount of space around them, like the Perdido landfill, mm -hmm. but there's several places that we've really had to shoehorn them in and, and just use every abs uh, space to the best possible use. So yeah, it's challenging. It's important to have a, a decent buffer around it and the traffic in and traffic out has to be very, very well controlled in order to not impact the neighborhood. So yes, ma'am. One of the other elements to that is the smell and odors. What we've done on some of the previous ones is misters and then exterior misters with a fragrance. Um, they've, they've actually come a long way with these uh, fragrance misters. They do it a lot around composters in public areas and transfer stations as well. Because it's, it's, if I lived next, right next door to one, I would not enjoy that smell too much. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Jimmy. And I, I, I've actually seen one of those, some of those, um, and um, you know, real in real close quarters like this that work very well. I mean, you could be right across the street and can't even smell it. Different scents and different. What What about um, you? You touched on odor control. What about bird control? Do you have any issues with birds, and how do you? Yeah. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, that's all right. Actually, we find at transfer stations that have a closed front typically have very few bird problems if you manage them inside uh, the transfer station. That is, if you keep it clean and you keep not standing water. I have a little bit of a story, Alachua County, uh, the project had just finished, the, the floor had eroded so much that there was standing water and wading birds were actually nesting inside the transfer station. But we fixed that. <laughs> Very good. Um, so, You've done both where the tipping floor, and I'll ask this to Jimmy, I think, because we talked about it, where the tipping floor goes over the wall and, you know, whatever, or yep. you've done them where they drive in and then it's tipped in where you have from truck to truck. Yep. And which, which do you think has worked the best? It's a lot of it's depending on the amount that's actually going through that station. But my own preference, I do prefer the by level to where we have the open pits. Especially when I was looking at the at the uh, paperwork with the compactors, the compactors could actually be a stationary unit where the trucks back up to it, the the front loader pushes it down into the pit, everything's compacted, and then it's loaded onto the truck. So the only issue that comes up with that is phasing. So when you're trying to, if you have 50 trucks that are in a queue, that time is the only issue that I find. But if you're using those push, the push pit layouts where it goes straight through the floor, you have truck after truck after truck, and it's very efficient and cost effective. Okay, perfect, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Uh, do you have a Pensacola office? No, we don't have a okay. Pensacola office. If you did this project, would you? <laughs> yes or no? I no, we were, we, no, okay. I mean, we, Similar, like my story in NASA, we did not have an office there either, but five years after that project, when we started getting more and more work, yes, we opened up an office. Sure. So sure. It, it, it obviously depends on the amount of work we do. Sure, sure. I, I have a concern similar to Ms. Campbell. I look at the Pasco building, the Brevard, the Walton building, and they all have a lot of acreage there. You know, our challenge is we are going into an existing neighborhood with an existing traffic pattern, and, and that is probably the fundamental challenge of this project, um, where you just, you're, you're limited uh, in, in space and, and you have to take these things into consideration. You can't just do a functional warehouse design and have it fit in. And, you know, that's always a problem that ECUA has, whether we're building lift stations or sewer plants or sanitation. How, how would you make this compatible with, where, with its setting? Brian's going to try to answer a little bit of that, and he's going to take you to the Tampa project back again because that is a very tight project. It doesn't show it there, but there's a lot of existing facilities to the north and to the south, and this is all crammed into one site. With all, so they wanted all these five, six buildings with all the traffic flow and, and so I'll let Brian talk a little bit more about it. And just to clarify, is, is the existing area residential or is it all commercial? Uh, it is all industrial area in this, in this, in this area. Um, 
This is where my experience and expertise in traffic routing and traffic engineering would definitely be of use on this project. As I mentioned on several of the other projects, the city of Tampa one specifically, which is a very, very cramped and congested site, that the city is merging the operations of several different facilities all into the same location. So we had to take a step back, look into the project and say, which vehicles are going where and how are they getting there? One of the solutions that we came up with on this project was actually the addition of a new remote scale location on the north side of the facility. And what I had realized is about half of the trucks that are entering this facility are going to an existing waste to energy building on the north side of the site. By adding a new remote scale, that cuts the traffic going through the main scale house by almost 50%. So we were able to drastically increase the efficiency of the site overall by separating traffic. And that's, that's a big consideration in overall traffic management on a city level for a municipality is segregation of traffic. So one of the things that we would look at for at your site is which vehicles are coming from where and how are they getting to where they're trying to go and doing our best to separate the traffic so there's not overlaps in traffic, reduction of intersections, minimizing crossing patterns in the roadway and that would definitely increase the efficiency of the site and it can also reduce the footprint overall. I'd like to touch on, I'd like to touch on part of your question there as far as taking the industrial type building and putting it smack dab in a residential neighborhood. We did a, uh, the Polk County water production facility surrounded by residents. What we did is a neighborhood study. We went and looked at certain architectural elements, certain aesthetics of those buildings and found ways to use and to, to kind of adapt a aesthetic style and shrouding and landscape that was one of the huge obst obstacles that we ran into was you have this big building smack dab in people's beautiful homes. So by shrouding, landscaping, uh, using different materials to try and adapt that and not really put a mask on it, but give it a different identity. Um, because I know exactly, I went through board members in res uh, the public hearings over and over to get this approved through it. And finally we came up with a solution that not only functioned well, looked pretty good for a, for a, uh, a water production facility. Lips, lipstick on a pig, is that what you're <laughs> yeah. uh, Did you have another question, Mr. Williams? Or? I did. I'm sure, go ahead. Uh, basically, the, the training of employees, how will the training of employees be incorporated in this design? Uh, who will train the employees? <laughs> On the operations of the facility? On the operations of the facility. Well, I, I know we would start with Alan Altman. I mean, he, he is, works for us, and he is also, um, he, he's operated, like I said, uh, MRFs and transfer stations for 30 years before he retired and came to work for us. So I would say we'd be able to come up with a, at least a training plan uh, that, that he would help us create and, and help train some of your employees. Have you done it in the past? Typically, the uh, typically the landfills have, have trained their own, they're trained their employees. I mean, they have to go to uh, op they probably have to go to um, their safety. The um, what, what the, landfill game's all? the landfill operation uh, uh, schooling. There, there's all there's all certifications that they would have to have. So they would have to get those to, to uh, operate some of those to operate the transfer station. Now, any type. Any type of equipment that we design in, as far as architecturally, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, that all comes with O&M manuals, and the vendor uh, works in coordination with the contractor to give that training at the end of it for the uh, interior stuff, as far as architectural and equipment itself. Right. That's so all O&M manuals. Yeah. So Sorry. anything like the compactors, which are very highly mechanical, those vendors would be out there. We would put that in the specs. That they typically two to three days that they would be there to train train and all the operators. Really, that's the main uh, main mechanical thing you're going to have is that is the. Okay, thank you. How, uh, question follow up: How long do you ex do you expect your design to last as a building? 
That would be contingent on what type of materials we're looking at. Um, if we look at a, a pre-engineered metal building, which is a steel structure with metal corrugated panels, the corrugated panels are not uh, set up to last over 10 to 15 years, and that's maintenance. Um, the last one we designed, we did half concrete at the base and uh, pre-engineered metal building above. The roof has a 20 to 25 year warranty on it. Um, the wall panels have about a 10 to 15 year concrete. As long as the maintenance is, is upheld, that's gonna last, you could last 40 years with that. Um, but it's all a it all depends on what type of material that we're using and the preferred longevity of it for the maintenance. Based upon your RFQ, how long do you expect this project design to last? And consider and consider hurricanes in this area. I mean, what? I'm sorry. Just just to clarify, you're talking uh, the time it's going to take us to start design until it's operational. Is that the time frame we're talking about, or is it how long the facility? I'm sorry. Years of of active operation of the facility? Most transfer stations, have effectively, if you keep them maintenance, they'll essentially, I'm not going to say forever, but they last a long time. Uh, 30, 40 years, we just replaced a floor, a floor in Alachua County that was a facility that has been in place for 30 yeah. years. What we're doing in Green Cove Springs, we're replacing the roof on a building that was uh, in place for 30 years. So as long as there's routine maintenance, I, I'd say it's kind of like a ship. You know, you, you fix it and then it starts getting old again. And you just, it, it has to be a continuous maintenance cycle. Okay, okay, okay. Um, one, one point to add on that, when we design stuff in the coastal regions, we have to design it per uh, essential building. So this would actually be a class four building uh, that withstand the amount of winds. Typically it's 140 miles an hour or, or greater. Um, so anything that we would design would definitely be to those hurricane standards, okay. especially after all the last few storms that we've had. All right, thank you, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams, and I see no more questions. Thank you so much for one. coming to Pensacola. Oh, oh sorry, I'll see who's here. Go ahead, Ms. Perkins. Yeah, I, I concur with my fellow board members that we want to be good neighbors, and it is going into an existing neighborhood, and I've heard discussion about aesthetics and appearance and odors. What about noise? I mean, you know, they're gonna, trucks gonna be there, people coming to work early in the morning. Is there anything on these facilities that are designed to um, either operationally or, or physically reduce the noise to the neighborhood? Buffers? Landscaping and buffers work pretty well, as long as you're not something to break up the direct between me and you of the, of the line of sight. The other thing that is really important is are the operational procedures. You really train your people where to dump and not let their uh, back tailgate slam because that tends to be a lot of the noise that's generated. So a lot of that has to be done with what we would call administrative controls. But we will, uh, things like buffer and separation One of the other elements to that is the actual orientation of the design. Um, what we would do is a neighborhood analysis and find out where, where the, everything's pointing in and, and what would be the best orientation of that building to kind of focus those. Um, one thing that we've done on some of the, in Plant City, we use wedges and wedges break up acoustics. It'll break up the sine wave and, and diminish the actual amplitude and magnitude of the sine wave itself. Does that conclude, Mr. Perkins? Uh, okay, and I see no more questions. So thank you very much for coming to Pensacola and for your presentation. Thank you very thank much. You Appreciate you. it. Thank you. And then our final presentation will be Mott McDonald. So. Dale, did you hit your speaker button? Yeah, it didn't show on mine. I don't know why. Because everybody else showed up. Okay. Let's 
so good afternoon and thank you for joining us. Um, and you may proceed with your presentation. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, the time and the opportunity to present today. Um, we are with Mott McDonald. My name is Andrew Gibbs. I'm the project principal and account lead for a lot of ECUA projects that we work with uh, and an electrical engineer. With me today is Mr. Bill Perry. He's uh, got 40 years of experience and is our account principal and has worked a lot in a, ver a variety of municipal markets. Also, we've got Mr. Chad Liner, who is our uh, project manager for this opportunity and an excellent structural engineer. Three of us have worked together extensively over the past 15 years or so to deliver projects throughout the communities that we live in. Uh, you've heard from a lot of great teams today, and we want to uh, answer the question for you of why Mont McDonald. Uh, we think that we have an unmatched local presence and knowledge of the area. We can show relevant experience with the building systems that are going to be involved, and we can show a deep project understanding. In regards to our local uh, presence, Chad and I are both based right here in Pensacola. We have quite a bit of staff in the local area, and the advantage that provides to the ECUA is uh, we can access a site pretty quickly if something goes wrong. Just yesterday, uh, I responded to an issue that happened on site, was able to see the issue, come up with a solution, and we were ready to go by the end of the day to have that resolved. So we're here to serve. Um, we're not just involved with water wastewater projects with the ECUA, um, such as the Government Street Lift Station. We were involved in this very building that we're standing in today. Um, we've worked out at the MRF, and importantly, we have some experience at the Godwin Lane campus itself. So here we have a, a nice overview of the Godwin Lane campus. Um, recently, we did a design for a maintenance garage that did not go to construction, but it gave us a nice uh, involvement with the site. Uh, on the west side of this campus here is where we have our compressed natural gas facility for fueling uh, the, the public vehicles as well as the trash vehicles uh, overnight. And uh, recently, or several years ago, we uh, were involved with adding a backup uh, generator to that site to provide power uh, when, when power was out after a storm. Um, recently, uh, we improved the truck access to that facility to allow trucks to enter the site, the campus, off of Pine Forest Road rather than accessing from Godwin Lane. Um, and through that and a fuel tank project that we're also involved with, uh, that's currently ongoing. We know a lot about the trees that are on this site, and they can be seen as an obstacle, but they can also be a benefit to this project overall and create that natural barrier to the surrounding property. So moving forward, Mr. Liner's gonna, Chad will talk to us about our relevant experience. Thank you all. Yes, I'm, I'll be discussing um, Mott McDonald's relative experience for I'm a transfer station components. The image you see on the screen is the container freight building at the port of Panama City. And you're asking, so how's this relevant? Why is this relevant? Well, because all the components you see up there will be at your Godwin Lane facility campus. You're going to have material handling and storage. You'll have material transfer. You'll have truck logistics and backing. You'll have fire protection, dust control. you have building ventilation, air quality issues, systems. you have storm water management systems. You'll have specialized equipment such as scales, bag houses, as well as instrumentation and control. Mott McDonald has completed numerous uh, maintenance buildings across the southeast. The most recent one is the Beach Mosquito Control uh, uh, building over in Panama City. But this was a single story pre-injured metal building that had, in which the clear story height had to be coordinated with the vehicles that were maintained. With due to these heavy weights of equipment, such as the motors and the bodies on the trucks, a bridge crane was installed. Space was also allocated for offices, restrooms, mezzanines, and storage. Mott McDonald also, <clears throat> but this is one of the I mean, Mott McDonald I mean, permitted facilities. This was sited at a closed uh, I'm a landfill over in Baker in Okaloosa County. Uh, this was an open style transfer station for waste management. The open transfer stations are typically in rural settings in which this is the opposite of what it is at Godwin Lane because this is very much an urban environment setting in which there's many more factors to be considered as far as design and the permitting in which, in which Bill will be covering here shortly. And then lastly, as far as the project understanding goes, 
I'm Mike McDonald. I may mean, ask the question during the RFP process. What type of uh, I mean materials will be de I mean, deposited here? And ECA responded with solid municipal waste, commercial solid waste, recyclables, and yard waste. What is the benefits for having this transfer station? At, I mean, at the Godwin Lane campus for ECUA. Number one, it cuts down for I mean for the route reduction times. It is more efficient and for timely collection, and as well as it reduces the truck traffic and and plus also your fuel consumption. Now, to take and continue on with the project understanding, here's Mr. Bill Perry. Thank you, Chad. And uh, thank you guys for having us here. Uh, really excited to be here. Uh, as Chad mentioned, your facility will be in, in a more urban setting, and so there are things that, that will be of concern in helping develop uh, this site. So some of the common canons of concern uh, from surrounding community would be noise, odor, dust, vectors, uh, traffic, and, and litter. So uh, what about the noise? So noise, uh, you, you know, if you've got backing vehicles, large vehicles like that, you've probably heard the tink, tink, tink of it backing up, compactors compacting uh, the trash and those types of things. Lots of noise. So how, how do we address and mitigate that? Well, we'll be doing that through... Uh, designing a more enclosed structure for you uh, to try to hold down on that. Uh, we'll utilize uh, different types and forms of, of uh, construction materials uh, using, using berms perhaps in some of the perimeter areas, using concrete construction that dampens sound and attenuates sound, those types of things. Odor is always a big issue when it comes to uh, you know, anything solid waste. So you want to try to mitigate that as best you can. Uh, many times that's addressed through some type of uh, misting type of odorant. There's also uh, charcoal treatment systems and biological systems that can be done, especially when you use an enclosed structure and you can capture that air and treat it. Uh, dust can be a huge issue and uh, we've had a lot of experience the the slide that uh, Ch chad uh, showed you where uh, down at fort panama city we had a large wood pellet warehouse and dust was a big concern there so we had a a, uh, a collection system where we captured that air and we ran it through a bag house to to take care of that now that's an extreme uh, the other end of that is the potential to mist as well and help hold down on dust. So all of those things will be factored in. Vectors, uh, enclosed facilities, clean operations, compaction equipment that, that uh, allows you not to have so much uh, of the garbage out and about is, is good. Traffic concerns, getting our vehicles in and out is, is critical. And, and litter, again, the housekeeping and some of the transfer uh, uses are, are very beneficial. All right, so, so project understanding and, and project design objectives. So uh, ECU, ECUA has their site selected. Uh, the key now is for us to help develop that site and help it be an efficient site for you. Uh, the efficiency of getting your vehicles in and out of this facility are going to be important to help you realize the economies of scale that you will get by putting in a transfer station. We're here to help you do that. Durability is huge and resilient designs uh, are big. You'll see as we present here uh, that you got a lot of big trucks moving in tight spaces. Uh, you need to design for that. We, we know we've been involved in a lot of this. Uh, we've been here since uh, Hurricane Ivan hit in this area. I've just been through all of Hurricane Michael. We've learned a lot of the things about resiliency and design. Uh, flexibility, we got to ask the question, the what if, what if, your power goes out, we gotta have backup power. What if one of your compactors goes out? What does that do to your operation? These are the types of things that we'll be asking staff and trying to help develop a good program for you. Cost efficiency, this is probably one of the areas where we can really help. We've been in this area for 40 plus years. We've got a lot of construction data, recent bid vertical construction and heavy civil work that we keep a library of all of those costs and can really help you as we progress through in the planning stages, 30%, 60%, and 
such that you don't have surprises when it comes to the end and, and we bid the job. And safety is always a key component. So this was the site layout that you had uh, in your RFQ. Uh, you know, scale houses, uh, there's going to be vehicle queuing that's going to be really important. What we don't want to do is have uh, vehicles backing up onto the neighboring roads. So we've got to make sure that we can move the traffic through. We want to make sure that we keep uh, your collection trucks separated from your uh, uh, transfer trucks and, 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 you know, have effective moving of traffic through the site. Uh, a lot of these facilities, you see the vehicle parking there, typically they'll have a uh, trailer buddy where they can move uh, tractors around. You may have a situation where you have a truck go up to the landfill and, and they get delayed up there. You're still trying to process trash. You need to have the ability to bring another container in and set it in place. So all those things are put in place to help you. And then as Chad mentioned, we've done a lot of maintenance facilities. Port Panama City, the big job that they showed there, that he showed, we put in a, a big state-of-the-art, uh, really tall, elevated, modern facility there. We had to tear down three structures and keep two while we built that back. That was a combination of that demolition and reconstruction. And uh, we, so we're accustomed to doing that, and we'll have a lot of that type uh, of work to deal with where we're working in close proximity to existing facilities. I wanted to give you just some, some visuals of, of what's going on. You see the collection vehicles in the upper left. Uh, that floor is approximately 14 feet above the lower floor, which is your transfer floor. There's a lot of ways to attack the structure on that and do things cost effectively. We feel like that that your exit or your transfer vehicle should be kept at ground. One of the things that helps control leachate issues and things of that nature is not letting a bunch of stormwater runoff and things like that run back into your facility and get mixed with, with your leachate. So we want to try to handle that. Uh, lower left, you see all of the uh, green trucks or your collection trucks, big trucks moving inside of a building we have auto turn modeling capabilities to help us show exactly how the tires and everything track through there and can make sure that we can get those vehicles in and out. And then you see your transfer trailers on the, the right hand side there, being able to get them in and out, very important. We created, we have the ability to do what we call BIM modeling or building information modeling where we create visuals that you can see as you progress through the construction. You see on, on the left side, we took your concept and, and basically created uh, a visual model for you. You can see up in the upper right hand corner of the left picture, uh, the proposed uh, transfer station and over in the left uh, corner of that same picture, you see where the, the uh, maintenance building would go in just give you a little bit of concept of how that sets in and how we would try to work, uh, as Andrew mentioned, around uh, the trees, take advantage of them for uh, visual uh, screening and those types of things, and, and of course, try to mitigate uh, any impacts uh, to those trees. Uh, the, the picture to the right is, is taking a look at the uh, transfer station well. What we wanna do is try to keep that water coming away from the building not going back to the building, but you can see up to the top of that gray is, is the 14 feet or so. So to be able to construct that upper tan level, you know, using some creative ways of, of bringing in uh, uh, fill, you know, structural fill and building will, will greatly reduce costs on, on the structure. Talk to you a little bit about enclosed versus open. Uh, we, we show the enclosed building to the left. That's a McLeod transfer station down in Orange County. Uh, I wanted to show that to you because it, it, talks, it, it shows a lot of the things that you can do. In this particular case, uh, they used ramps, which you can see uh, leading into the structure there. Uh, and, and that's for your inbound uh, collection trucks. And then the perimeter Asphalt is how they separate the transfer trucks and bring them through the site and out and through uh, to, to pick up their, 
their hall and go to the landfill with it. To the right is actually the city of Pensacola transfer station. Uh, that's another way of being able to build up by using uh, the grades to work in your favor. And so uh, instead of building with really expensive ramps, they were able to uh, do a, a grade situation to build the upper portion of that. You know, the enclosed allows you to keep everything inside the house. The open uh, is a more economical uh, thing, but it's also very difficult in, in an established uh, commercial area like you have. Just the systems that have to go to support. Uh, we mentioned bag house and dust control. Uh, you know, whether we go that far or whether we use misters or something is, is something that would be vetted uh, as we looked at cost, odor control, generators, uh, leachate collection systems, and again, trying to minimize getting any cross up between surface waters and, and uh, the actual trash. Stormwater collection, if you were to recess uh, the, the transfer station, then you'd have to try to pump that stormwater over to your stormwater pond, which is, is slated to go in, in the northeast uh, corner of the site. So we want to try to avoid that. Fire suppression systems and the oil water separators would be involved. Uh, the leachate will have to talk uh, with staff and understand whether or not uh, you can take that leachate or whether it would need to be hauled to a, a receptor facility. And then permitting, uh, as, as Chad hit on, we've done a lot of permitting. The key to permitting is, is to have pre-application meetings, uh, converse with the regulators early and often to make sure that we're all in, in it together and that we're, we're looking at the project, uh, you, you know, and considering the things that are big concerns to them. Uh, you know, the bottom line, if you look up in the upper right at the check marks, Permitting drive schedule and schedule determines cost. That's typically what happens. Uh, it's Gambia County. We know we have some issues to deal with with the with the tree structure, uh, and and we certainly think that we've got a way that we can can do that to try to help mitigate uh, and and avoidance is always key. And then just from a, a closure standpoint, I think. Uh, uh, Andrew said it best. We've, we've worked together a long time. I opened the office for Mike McDonald in, in 2000 in Panama City. I've been working with ECUA ever since, part of the CWRF process and, and all of the work that was done there and many in between. These two young men beside me have been working with me ever since. We've all worked on the, on the work that we've shown you guys. I think the, probably the key to it is that we're very familiar with the types of construction that we're, we're going to be dealing with here and oftentimes what controls change orders and things in the field is being responsive and being here and we have very good experience in that area and a really good track record so we would ask that you consider and choose Mike McDonald. That wraps it up. We'll take any Thank questions. you so much. And I don't even see any lights uh -oh. on. Uh, I've got one. Okay, Ms. Campbell. I see other people in there. Larry why am I not see? Larry and Dale. Uh, this particular speaker. I apologize. Nothing's coming up. There's Larry. I, uh, I, just I think, what, I think uh, what's happening is that some people might be on item A for presentation and some people might be on item B. Yes. I'm requesting to speak. Yeah, if you would uh, be on item B, please, to request to speak so that we're... Um, okay, I see you now, Ms. Campbell. All right, we'll start with Mr. Williams. I'm sorry, this is a little internal control issue. You uh, I think about the chair. I think they basically hit on most of what I wanted to know. The biggest concern I have would be the uh, building's ability or the design of the building to withstand hurricane and h however long would you expect it to last in a normal life, life cycle of a building. 
So uh, I'll speak a little bit to that. Uh, I think probably a good example of that would be the Government Street lift station that that, uh, that Andrew brought up when he was talking about some of your facilities. That facility's been designed for a Category 5 storm uh, for a 15-foot surge. Uh, it's built out of... Uh, concrete material, substantial concrete materials. It was also built with the motif of downtown. It really looks like a building as, a, uh, as opposed to a pump, sewer pump station. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, we would be considering all of that, but as far as life cycle is concerned, if, if, if handled well, you, you know, uh, metal building type construction, uh, you know, typically you try to build for a 50 plus year design life, but if it's done well and maintained well, it's just like your home or anything else, it will last much longer. Okay. <clears throat> I guess as you talk about noise, odor, my biggest concern on that, in that area would be transportation as the area, as all Pensacola is, is growing. So, uh, would you be able to design it so that uh, most of the traffic would be within the facility space as opposed to on the road and it wouldn't be any backups? Yes, sir. So very good question. We've looked at that. You guys, have, we, we know you've already done a lot of work. Uh, we certainly see some opportunities to think about the logistics of truck traffic there. We even had a concept that we, we kind of threw together ourselves where we looped a road beyond the, the jockey truck and, and trailer parking to circle inbound traffic around that way and give them a little bit better uh, storage uh, staging for queuing to go in and also would give you better slopes to get up to that higher 14-foot level. So, so we have looked at it. We think there is certainly opportunity there uh, to to handle it on site but even if it's stretched off a of site I think it would be from the perspective of of uh, adding uh, some turn lanes potentially uh, you, you know but we'll be able to address that much more as we look at it but we have looked at uh, the opportunities there and we think that there are opportunities to do that through some of what we're talking about there's also different truck movements. When you start talking about an 18-wheeler and how it backs up on a 90 degree to a dump station, it needs to be set up to give the, the truck driver a chance to succeed and there are certain kind of rules of the game there that you want to try to, to, to position that truck, bring him in at the right, uh, in the right direction and back him up to the dump spot at the right direction. So there's a lot of things in that regard that Again, what we want to do is talk about and ask those questions uh, of, of, of the staff that, that ECUA would be uh, having us work with and also bring in the users and talk with them as well. There's a lot we can learn and gain from those that do it every day. So, so is that your plan on training or bringing the employees of ECUA up to speed on on uh, being able to operate within the facility, how would you train or assist those employees in being able to be efficient at using this new facility? Yes, sir. So, so I, I, I might turn that around and say we'll let them train us. They're the guys that actually do those maneuvers. What we want to do is talk with them about what they can best do and then through some of the tools that we have look at the geometries and make sure that uh, like when, when we were showing the trucks moving inside the building that we can get them in and out of there but it, it's a give and take with both parties we'll talk about and ask the questions and and hopefully learn from them uh, you know what is most doable for them what is the easiest way for them back up to the dock which which side of the cabin uh, needs to be on, you know, which side does the driver need to be on versus the docking point, those types of things. So uh, it's, a, it's a process that we would go through in, in the early planning. Okay, last question. I see you have one female uh, listed in your, in your brochure. Do you have any other uh, people of color in the company? 
Uh, yes, sir, we do. We, we have, uh, we have a, a, a very diverse uh, group, both, both uh, throughout the, uh, I mean, the, the lady that helped us put this package together, I actually asked her if she could come and, and sit in. It's a very, very capable young lady. Uh, she's got a young child at home, so she was unable to make it up today, and that's something else that we always try to do is, is make sure that we can accommodate uh, our staff. And so that's very important to us. And uh, yes, sir, we have people of color throughout the country, not uh, uh, don't have one in, in, in my office, but uh, got probably uh, six or seven females in my office. It's, it's a 19 person firm. So we take that very seriously. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Williams. I think marriage is working out with you. You've been asking about women employees. <laughs> it's good to hear. Uh, Ms. Campbell. So um, have you built any transfer stations in a, like an area like this, rural? I mean, a urban area where it's really close to community and houses and you know, this footprint is tight. It, it is tight and that's the reason we wanted to show you the, the uh, McLeod station uh, and, and Listen, when, when we put these things together, one of the things that we would want to do is once we start talking about equipment and things, we think it makes a lot of sense to, to travel to some of those locations and look at those operations. But to answer your question specifically, yeah, we, we have a, a guy named Brian Henning and uh, Dave Abair up in our northeast operations that, that are constantly faced with dealing with, with uh, solid waste and, and really tight uh, spaces. So e even to the point of procuring equipment and those types of things. So uh, yes, ma'am, we have done how that. Have you, how have you um, handled odor in these tight areas before? So, so uh, what I had mentioned to you, we, we uh, used in, in uh, one of our facilities, we, we used an odorant for misting. Uh, both on the floor and in the uh, effluent exhaust fans of the structure. We had small odor at misting that was used there. Uh, had a large uh, lift station over uh, in a, in a uh, heavily populated area over in Jacksonville and used a, 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 a biological system for uh, scrubbing the air. Uh, so there's, there's different... Uh, Processes like that that can be used basically in that scrubber the air feeds up through it and and, and is treated and discharged uh, Out at a, at a higher level Have you ever dealt with any? Um, I'm sure you've dealt with vermin snakes and what have you but have you dealt with birds in these had any issue with that? Well, well you see you see a lot of those there and and the the, the best way to handle that is is housekeeping and the methods uh, I, I mean it's solid waste and you've got to deal with a lot of those types of things, but in closed spaces, the type of transfer, we understand that uh, uh, you're, you're looking at a compactor system that may have a, a rammer that, that uh, feeds into a, a roll-on, roll-off type of, of container uh, that, that holds the waste inside. So the, the biggest issue with that is, is being able to control uh, the, the waste and, and I think you're on a good track there. I think it's important that we go see some of those in operation and, and uh, make sure that we consider everything when setting something like that up. Uh, and then the other thing is, is controls, putting controls in, you know, pest controls and those types of things, so. Thank you. I, you know, the reason I asked that question and I ask all four of the, the folks doing their presentations today is, I visited a facility out in Huntington Beach, California, and they had no birds. And I couldn't understand. This was like a, a recycle center in station area. There was not a bird anywhere to be anywhere. I mean, you couldn't see a bird in the sky. And so I asked that question, where's the birds? Because every one of these type facilities I've ever been to, there were birds everywhere. And That's he said, right. oh, we've got that taken care of. And he said, Charles, come out here and show them our bird control. And a little seven, looked like he was about a 17-year-old boy, walked out and he had a big hawk Shoot. on his arm. Oh, yeah. And they let this hawk go every right. couple hours and he goes up and takes a couple of whirls around. 
yeah. and he comes back down and boom, there's no birds. Yeah. So that's uh. something, you know. I, I didn't hear anybody say it today when I asked about the birds, but <laughs> that was the most unique method of them? bird control well, that I've ever sounds heard like of. a pretty economical way to do it. <laughs> but, you know, some other too, things yeah. you were asking about, the, the odor control and, and, you know, if you imagine yourself going in a Dillard's and walking in the entrance and you walk into a vestibule uh -huh. that has sliding doors or opening doors, you get into that and the doors to the facility are still closed. You can do that with vehicles too, such that you close the outside before you enter the facility. All of that costs uh, money, uh, but it's things that if they are uh, really problematic, uh, it may be something that you make a provision to design onto the structure in the future, and if it becomes an issue for you, it can be added on. The port facility, some of the, the reason we put that in there, there's a lot of moving parts that are very similar to this one. We put that type of entrance in there not for the odor part of it, but to keep wind-driven rains from getting into that pellet warehouse because that water just totally disintegrates those pellets and very important to them. And instead of just putting a canopy up there, we put a canopy in sides, you know, in the form of a building, and that kept wind-driven rains outside and not in the building. So. Uh, we, we have seen a lot of these situations and feel like we've got, you know, good solutions for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I see no more speakers. Uh, thank you for all that you've done for the ECUA. We've been working with you for a long time. And thank you for your thoughtful presentation. Um, I, this concludes the presentation of our uh, consultants. So. Thank you. And we very much appreciate it as well and appreciate you. Uh, I think it's probably time for about a five-minute comfort break. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we will resume at 7 after.
for this record. So, come on. Now. I thought you were talking about <laughs> so we we will bring our meeting back to order. Um, we have we have seen the presentations for the four very very competent consultants, and our task now is to rate them or to make to make a selection. And I'm I'm happy to let this sort of go however you'd like to do it. If you'd like to simply make a recommendation individually or um, let's just open it up for discussion. And if you'll put your, uh, if you'll highlight, let's highlight adoption of general resolution GR23 so that when you hit speaker we are all on the same thing. So now I, I see Mr. Williams first. So Mr. Williams, please proceed with your comments. Okay, well then I will, I'll, I'm going to take you out of the queue and go with Mr. Perkins. Thank you. I, I don't know whether we want to, um, you know, have a sheet with the four names on it and each rank our priorities and see if we have similarities or if we want to just individually say, I mean, I I've, I've have mine ranked. I mean, I, I don't know how y'all want to do it, you know, so that. I, I Okay, so I'll, I'll just, just go. go I'll just, I'll just, just throw it just out speak. there. So, I was impressed with all four of them. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I like, I liked them all. I think all of them had um, strengths. I think Akatus, um, you know, as far as cost and cost management and, and timeliness and professionalism. I, you know, if we were doing letter grades, I, I gave them an A. I think uh, Jacobs was was really well. Uh, you know, on safety and, and public outreach, I, th I thought they did really well. I, I ranked them an A minus. You know, they they uh, <laughs> they they were they're really good. Um, Jones Edmonds had a lot a lot of good uh, experience and uh, and their focus on safety impressed me. I ranked them a B plus. I thought they were exceptionally good. And then um, to me, H M M. You know, I, I ranked them an A plus just on the depth of understanding. You know, they answered all the questions before before we asked them. They had plans. They understood the neighborhood. They understand the local area, the other governmental entities. They probably have relationships with them. And so, to me, um, and they've got a national, you know, a national team with a lot of expertise. So, you know, the local office, of course, a couple of the others do too. But to me, it was close. But to me. I would rank them first, then Arcadis, then um, Jacobs, and then Jones Edmonds. So that's just kind of where I'm got them. I'm willing to listen to anybody. I'm not firm on on you know. I don't. It doesn't have to be my way or highway on any of this. Of course, it never does. But but um, you know that's just kind of where I, my read on them. I thought they were all excellent. Um, I just think a, a couple of them, you know, were a little bit above the others. Um, you and I were pretty close in our, our ranking. I, um, I, I think we could could take a draw straws and pick any of them, and they would be good. I think they were all very competent and 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 uh, excellent, and did wonderful presentations. Um, I, I, I put Arcadis first, just because of the depth and the breadth of their knowledge. <coughs> Of, of sanitation and, and utilities, uh, our long history of working together. They have always provided timely advice and information, and um, I, I I rank them slightly higher than Hatchmot uh, because of uh, um, they have resources that are extensive. So um, again, uh, we could have draw, drawn straws, but my first choice is Arcadis. Anyone else? Do you want to just have a piece of paper and with all rank? I, or I've got we? my speaker thing on, but I don't know if I've oh. got it on the right place. Where are we supposed to be? Uh, on adoption of the general resolution number GR. Don't ask me why this is. Okay, that's what I thought I had mine on. On letter A. Oh, okay, I had it on B. Sorry. Yeah, there we go. Okay, Miss Campbell. Okay, so I, I too... I rank them, and I rank them on cost preparedness for for today. Um, I gave a little more 
leverage to the same type of facility that we're looking at building and then um, how, how the question and answer went. And I came out with uh, Arcadis, Jacobs, then Mott. Uh -huh. okay. And I did, all I did was just give an amount and I had that ready and for each one and added them up and the totals were what they were. Yeah, I, I think Arcadis led with the the most important factor in in this which is the site you know all of those other things are subsidiary to making all of these things work at the the, the site although it was addressed by others uh, mr williams okay wait for my to turn green thank you madam chair I'll have to admit I was a little inexperienced in that process of, of actually going through very technically and uh, listing and grading, but the Q&A was what I really paid attention to and the interaction I had with the different uh, speakers. And I thought Jacobs uh, and their Q&A really st stood up to me and Arcadia. And then <clears throat> the last presenter was actually uh, impressive in the sense that they did kind of better anticipate what the what the requirements would be and give us a visual of how that would go so uh, Jake was the one that I actually said was was first but then um, the last speaker was 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 very impressive as well Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. Uh, Mr. Stevens, I don't see your light, but I'm just going to call on you. I see your yeah. fighting on you. You know, and, and uh, again, just, just I mean, I, I think all four of them could do a very good, very competent job. This was, this was kind of a tough one because I mean, the reality is just looking at the qualifications, looking at the skill set, they've all built similar facilities. So I was kind of going into this trying to find one that had built something similar, um, had waste uh, water treatment facility experience and um, some of the some of the some of the uh, and they all seem to have had that just just you know, the questions when it came to odor and sound and the different criteria um, they seem to check all the boxes I did like to I liked uh, Jimmy Jimmy's uh, with Luntz's group's uh, vision and uh, uh, animation and and and, 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 and and thought process on on how to overcoming some of the objections or some of the obstacles when it comes to sound and noise reduction and so forth so so like I said that was good Acadia um, it's it's a tough one it's kind of kind of like what but, uh, um, what Dale said you know I don't it, it, I, I would be honestly I hate to, to be so neutral because that's not in my nature um, to be so am amicable, but I mean, I'm really happy with, you know, with, with all four of them. So it, I would be a, I'm probably not going to be a tiebreaker on this one, uh, okay. when it comes to, uh, when you it comes to competency, I, I do have to make a decision. So I guess we're just going to, I'll have to, I'll have to flip a coin over here. Um, I would say I, I was pulling for the Jacobs team. They're young and, and hungry, which I think is always a good thing. I'm not sure they have the bench. For, for this project, and, and that would be my concern. Um, I'm familiar with all the subs they use, too. Most yeah. of them are using yeah. the same subs, same yeah. engineers, same uh, uh -huh. surveying, but, which are all competent uh, subs, by the way. Yeah. I don't know if that was brought up. Ms. Campbell. Uh, we could do it by a motion, sure. Go ahead. Mr. Woody, we that that's awkward to say. That, that the obligation is is yours, and the main thing we did was kind of short list to what do we have. Um, the, the two that you've um, mentioned as you're competing first and second were in accordance with feedback we were talking about amongst our staff. So I, okay. I think, and that's okay, Mr. Jacobs. But. Okay, so thank you. 
So I, I would like to make a motion that we rank them Arcadis, Jacobs, and Hatchmont, and Hatchmont, and let staff work with That's them. Fine. And if one doesn't work out, then move to the next. Okay. So they don't have to come back to us again if the first one doesn't work out, you know. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded. Now this is the time for discussion. And Mr. Perkins, you had your light on. Did you? Yeah. So I, I, uh, I'm going to support the motion. I, um, I still, you know, think Hatchmock uh, understands our um, situation better than any, and, and anticipate a lot of our problems. But I, I was real close with um, Arcadius and Hatchmock. And, uh, and I, do, I do think Jacobs has a lot of innovative ideas and approaches. The you know, one thing that I was concerned about, a little, and I know we don't have a local preference thing, but them not having a local office and having to come from Gainesville, you know, was a little bit of a factor for me, but not, not a disqualifying factor by any means. But uh, while I would prefer it be Hatchmott, Arcadis, or Arcadis Hatchmott, I do see a couple of my board members really like Jacobs, and I can I can support their their uh, ideas on that. So I think the motion, as it stands, is a good motion. And I'll be glad to support. It. Okay. Uh, does anyone else wish to speak to the motion? If not, we have Mr. Woody. Mr. Woody yes. Yeah, just a brief comment in response to uh, Ms. Campbell's. Uh, we pretty much follow the or we do follow the C, uh, CNA process um, as written in state legislature uh, and that is that uh, we rank in, in priority you make the you make the choice and then we um, go through a negotiation of refining the scope coming up with the associated cost if we can't come to terms on, on that administratively uh, then by default then we go to the, the next rank person right. which is the reason we ask for the rankings without having to come back to the board right and and this motion doesn't incorporate the, the rankings okay Anyone else? If not, please vote. And it passes 5-0. Um, I hope we will send a letter to all of those who mm. participated because, I mean, the, the pool was extraordinary and I think we all agree that any one of them could have done it. All right, thank you, board. We come now to the approval of the minutes of the regular board meeting of May 23rd, 2023. Um, uh, are there any additions or corrections to the, uh, the minutes as su submitted? Then we'll take a motion. Ms. Campbell moves it, Mr. Stevens seconds it. Please vote. And it passes unanimously. Item eight is the, the report of the May Special ECUA Advisory Committee meetings and report of the ECUA Advisory Committee of June 20th, 23. Ms. Campbell. Getting on. Okay, I don't see an attachment. Or, but that's okay. I have it printed here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, May 17th, 2023, the CAC met and did a presentation by the Budget Workshop, Human Resource and Administrative Services, and the presentation was by Ms. Kimberly Scruggs. There was a presentation of the CAC Budget Workshop on Customer Services presentation by Mr. Gabe Brown, Director of Customer Service. There was a presentation of the CAC Budget Workshop Maintenance and Construction by Mr. Jerry Piscopo, the Deputy Executive Director of Maintenance and Construction, and a presentation of the CAC Budget Workshop Regional Services by Mr. Brian Reed, uh, Director of Regional Services. On May 18th, 2023, we had presentations by the CAC Budget Workshop Water Reclamation uh, by Mr. Randy Sears, 
the workshop for engineering presentation by Mr. Stacy Hayden, Director of Engineering. I'm sorry, Mr. Sears is Director of Water Reclamation. Uh, Mr. Presentation was made on the water production by Mr. Tom Dawson, Director of Water Production. And a presentation on the sanitation was Mr. Oh, uh, Mr. Woody presented for sanitation. Uh, CAC budget workshop for materials recycle facility was done by Mr. Woody, or the, was moved to May 22nd, as was the MRF moved to uh, May 22nd. And then the board met again on May 22nd, and the budget workshop for CIP was done by Mr. Stacy Hayden, Director of Engineering, and the budget workshop for the materials recycle facility was done by Mr. Woody. Um, and then on June 20th, we had a 2024 budget message by Mr. Justin Smith, the finance director, and an adoption of general resolution GR 23-62, which was a resolution authorizing the extension of the annual service contract for the grounds maintenance for central water reclamation facility, regional lift stations, and the Gilmore Street storage tank. Uh, the motion was made by Mr. Stevens, second by Ms. Ritz, and passed 9-0. General res item G2 was a general resolution for GR 23-63, a resolution for the selection of a vendor to provide sanitary sewer collection system flow monitoring services. And the motion was made by Mr. Kirshner, second by Mr. Gaines, and the board ad adopted the general resolution 9-0. First, I would like to thank, again, Mr. Williams for handling those uh, CAC meetings on the 17th, 18th, and 20th. And I would like to thank staff for the wonderful presentations given to the board on the upcoming budget. And I would like to move items G1 and G2 from the June 20th meeting. We have a motion. Is there a second? Mr. Stevens seconds it. Any discussion? Not please vote. And it passes five zero. Does that conclude your report, Ms. Campbell? That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That the report was short, the meetings were long, and certainly <laughs> I echo your thanks to staff for all that they put into it. Um, Come to the consent agenda. The first item is adoption of general resolution number GR 23-59, a general resolution authorizing the executive director to execute a contract with Litvak, Beasley, Wilson, and Ball, LLP for attorney services at specified rates and providing an effective date. Uh, Mr. Woody. Uh, this contract is a proposal for a one-year contract with uh, an additional one-year extension if agreed to by both parties. Uh, differences between this and the prior uh, contract, we are increasing the reimbursable billing rate hour for uh, the attorneys in the office, uh, Mr. Beasley, Mr. Pugh to 220, and to Mr. DeWitt Clark to 195. That is a 10% increase over uh, the previous contract. Billing rate for law clerks, paralegals, and legal assistants would uh, remain the same. I'd uh, like to add a couple of comments and also point out a little handout that I've given to uh, each of the five of you, uh, prepared uh, for us by um, uh, Don Adamek, uh, summarizing some of their work over the last several years that's particularly worth uh, noting. Uh, I very much appreciate their uh, responsiveness to our organization and its many departments. At the very uh, bottom <coughs> uh, chart, you'll see the various departments and the types of requests that are, that are made that they provide services to, uh, they probably, uh, you can see by the numbers that they receive more requests uh, related to contracts more than anything else, which would be the engineering division, uh, as well as right away uh, associated with easements and uh, property acquisitions, et cetera. Uh, we're a large organization with 630 employees, so human resources is also very commonly a requested task uh, for assistance. But I really want to point out more than anything else is in the top uh, table under the column labeled total ca closed cases, you'll see the sum at the bottom there, 83. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, pent up 
pending cases at the time that they came into service uh, for this organization. And they have done a wonderful job of clearing the books, settling cases, uh, dealing with things that have just been hanging around for, for a long time. Um, and I'm this year now, after all this work they've been doing the past several years, I'm starting to actually see in the billable hours uh, a decrease that represents the f their completion of these past contracts or past uh, litigation issues. Uh, so now the, the majority of billings are, are leaning toward uh, day in, day out business, requests from departments, contract reviews, and, and those types of daily operational things. So they're very much to be commended for um, dealing with uh, past issues uh, effectively, quickly, and uh, keeping uh, providing good service while at the same time being very mindful of our build, billable hours and uh, as far as it being a cost center. So, thank you for those comments. I'd certainly offer anything that the wit would want to add to that. Yeah. All right. And the second item on the consent agenda, I, we'll we'll do a consent agenda format. Uh, there is probably one item we'll pull. Uh, is adoption of general resolution number GR 23-65, general resolution authorizing the executive director to execute a contract with Jacobs Engineering Group to perform the necessary data collection, engineering, and tasks for the Garden Street utility relocations, authorizing the creation of a new project number, authorizing the transfer of project funds, and providing effective date. Mr. Woody. Uh, the Florida Department of Transportation is doing a significant uh, drainage project along Garden Street from I Street to B Street. You'll see a map on page 147 of the uh, project limits. Uh, we're asking that uh, Jacobs be given uh, the engineering contract to do the data collection and engineering associated with um, dealing, uh, putting together plans to deal with um, conflicts of existing water mains and sewer mains uh, along this project. Uh, they also happen to be the engineer record for uh, the FDOT's uh, project, so that'll uh, really help expedite the project. Uh, item, let's see. Item D, wait a minute, sorry. C. C. Uh, this is one that there are speakers, no, no, I'm sorry, CETA. Uh, uh, adoption of general resolution number GR 2366, a general resolution authorizing the acceptance of bid and awarding of a contract, authorizing the executive director to execute a contract with Chavers Construction Inc. for $1,877,730 for construction of the Pensacola Beach Reclaim Water Main Phase 1B Part 1 project authorizing the use of funds. This is the one I, let's pull this off and uh, of the consent agenda and we'll come back because I know there are speakers. Um, item D is adoption of general resolution number GR 2367, a general resolution authorizing the executive director to execute a purchase order with Consolidated Pipe and Supply Company in the amount of $474,000. $143 for pipeline materials related to the Pensacola Beach reclaimed water main project. Um, go ahead, Mr. Woody. Uh, this project along Pensacola Beach will connect the um, water reclamation <coughs> facility. Um, if you look at a map, it's uh, available on page 165. We'll connect the Pensacola Beach water treatment plant uh, eventually with the storage uh, tanks that you see when you first, or one of the storage tanks that you see when you first come across the bridge. Uh, this is phase 1B, so it'll get it uh, down via DeLuna through the Casino Beach parking lot, across Fort Pickens Road where it stops. Another phase will pick it up from there. The purpose of this uh, uh, resolution is just for the purchase of pipe. Uh, we did that in advance of the construction in order to uh, be sure we had pipe materials available in time for construction during the off season. Okay, thank you. I have any questions on this one? If not, item, yes. I had one on 60, 65. Okay, so item B, you had one. Mr. Williams, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't ask for questions. Is there a reference to the CRP that we're going to pull those funds from? Yes. What, what uh, can you 
elaborate on that CIP and what's the plan to complete that CIP? I may have to ask for some assistance from Dawn if we can here. I believe that was remaining funds from a prior project. It's from Pine Forest to Kemp Road. You Let recognize ask, Mr. Which, Cohen? Uh, okay, which, I'm did on. Did you it. back up an item when you said item B? Yes, it's actually um, the funding for the the uh, the Garden Street okay. utilities. Item B. Right. Item B. And you're pulling the funds from CIP uh, CRO 14A which is the Pine Forest to Kemp Road. Okay. So what, what's now the plan for that CIP? I believe it's being replaced um, by a different project, but I, I'd have to get with Stacy. Stacy's not here, and I'll have to get back with you. I don't know exactly. I know they're looking at a different way to, to uh, handle that wastewater, and I don't know the answer. Can you get back with me on that one? Yes. That's kind of critical for for District Three. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. you. Uh, and Ms. Campbell, you had a question on which one? D. No, no B. Same one. Same one. Okay, go ahead. And mine was just the timeline and for that project. Mr. Woody. I don't know that I've heard. Right now, it's just in design. So, um, and and we're not the contractor of record. That's being done by F. Dot. So. Uh, I don't know what FDOT's timeline is for right now. So go to them. It's, it's, okay. yeah, the design, and the reason I asked is my is office sits beginning. right in the middle of that entire strip. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay. nobody's going to be able to get there for a while. It's uh, yeah. right there on H. It's, so. it's, it's a fairly lengthy uh, job. My understanding the work is done within the existing right of way. So a year for design, a year, year and a half for construction. Yeah. Typically. But. Well, luckily there's a back door. So. All right, anyone have any questions on item D? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay, Mr. Williams, go ahead. Yeah, that question would be, uh, is that, are we ordering all the pipe we need for that project with this general resolution or not? Uh, that is based on the engineer's uh, estimate of, of quantities for all that pipe, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, we go to item E, adoption of general resolution number GR2368, a general resolution authorizing the executive director to revise and replace an improved interlocal cost sharing agreement with Escambia County, authorizing a purchase order with Consolidated Pipe and Supply Company, Inc., in the amount of $347,386 for pipeline materials related to the Chemstrand Road water main replacement project, authorizing the transfer and use of project funds. Mr. Woody. That was a complicated one. Uh, you may be more familiar with the portion of Kim Strand north of Nine Mile Road that's recently been create, uh, completed. Looks very nice. They've added curb and gutter, and drainage improvements, sidewalks, et cetera. Uh, so just envision that scope of, of work being done on the south side of uh, Nine Mile, headed back down toward uh, East Johnson uh, Avenue. There's a map on page 171 uh, of your agenda that shows the project limits. Uh, this particular contract I, or resolution does two things. It uh, updates an interlocal cost sharing ag agreement uh, with the county. Uh, we have an agreement with the county that any time that we have transite uh, water mains within a project boundary, that they'll actually share the cost of replacing those 50, 50 with, uh, with us. So it's a wonderful savings uh, program. So we'll be putting in PVC and or ductile iron in various lo locations along this route. Um, so these are funds to do two things, uh, to purchase pipe ahead of time in the amount of 347386 and also to uh, update our interlocal agreement to reflect the fact that we're buying pipe in advance of the actual bid for construction of the project. Thank you. Any questions on item E? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Question would be, who determined the uh, where what was going to be redone on 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 Kim Strand was that the county or did we have any input on that? Uh, it's a county project in terms of the, uh, in terms of management, so they're in the driver's seat in terms of defining the limits of the project, uh, starting at Nine Mile and going down to Johnson Avenue. Um, 
that's driven usually it goes from major intersection to major intersection, tries to encompass uh, drainage areas or problems they have in a given area, plus, of course, affected by uh, you know, funding uh, issues. Uh, so within those project limits, then we identify what um, ECUA infrastructure is uh, affected and then put together a cost estimate based on the footage of pipe that needs to be replaced. So are those the only areas of concern along that route from on Kim Strand from Nine Mile to? For, for, for our facilities? Yes, sir. Yes, we'll be, we'll be replacing them in total along that entire alignment. But there were some other streets on that are connected to Kim Strand that are not been addressed, and so are they not in need of services? Um, in terms of water, water again, the, the, your initial question about the project limits are really driven by where the county, county will be working in the public right of way to do their drainage improvements. So, it, uh, for instance, if you look at the map on page 171, you may po point out that um, um, B land, if I may not be pronouncing that correctly, uh, is not included. There's a couple blocks in there, mm. whereas. Um, Kalen, Topeka, Camden, et cetera, are included. Uh, I'm sure those are driven by storm drainage uh, concerns in terms of how they set their limits. Um, but our 50-50 deal of them paying for part of our transite replacement um, only falls when we have those issues within their project limits. Okay. Uh, we're trying to maximize what we can do there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, the next item is item F, a general resolution authorizing the extension of the contract with Allied Universal Corporation of Miami, Florida for sodium hypo hypochlorite and providing an effective date. Mr. Woody. Uh, we have a current contract that allows for two one-year extensions of the contract with uh, Allied Universal Corporation. We purchase uh, chemicals from them, sodium hypochlorite, which is essentially ble bleach. Uh, and we use it for uh, wastewater disinfection, both at the CWRF as well as Pensacola Beach. Um, this would be the first uh, one-year extension. Normally, we come to you with extensions of the same unit prices based on the original contract. Uh, this particular time, we're requesting your consideration to uh, allow a price increase given the current state of the market. We're afraid to go ahead to market, quite frankly, the, with the rising price of chemicals. Uh, things have been going up, it may actually be accurate to say exponentially, uh, in the cost of uh, uh, chemicals. Uh, what we've uh, negotiated and talked with this supplier with is an increase of 37% over our prior um, year's cost. Uh, when we talk with our peers across the state, uh, the availability of this product is uh, sometimes in question, let alone uh, the nearly doubling of costs. Uh, just for comparison, though, this 37% uh, increase would still keep them below the price of our second place bidder last year when we did it. So we believe that it's still a favorable uh, rate and certainly more favorable than going out to the open market. Mr. Stevens, you had a question. As always, Mr. Woody, you typically answer my questions right before I turn my light on. But, but uh, yeah, my question was, uh, I'm assuming we've done just a cursory um, reach out to other bidders to kind of get a because thirty seven percent is pretty stout yeah. um, uh, increase. I mean, typically we're we're negotiating contract increases in, in a smaller percentage on a multi year contract. So it, it, we, we we renew it; it goes up. It can't go up by more than X Y Z. Are we? Are I'm assuming staff is looking at that. I mean, not just on this one, but going forward is 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 negotiating <laughs> these contracts. Whereas. They can't rise more than say five percent, and then we're it, it, so so we're, when we negotiate these contracts initially for multi years, we've got a max percentage that they're able to go up. That's um, my and, and, then, and then again, you've, you I'm sorry to interrupt you, but but and then again, going back to the first question, you have re, we've kind of reached out and put our feelers out, and and we still think this is the best price. Yeah, our typical. Uh, um, a typical um, contract language is that the uh, unit prices will not change year to year for extensions. I mean, literally zero. And that's why you'll see continually the language we present to you when we do renewals that the, um, the vendor has agreed to honor their existing uh, contract unit, unit prices. Uh, this is uh, different in that we 
uh, have really two options. Uh, since they are unwilling to uh, go forward at the same rate, then we would cut ties and go to the open market and, and advertise a, a bid. Uh, we're fearful of that given the current market conditions for chemicals. Uh, Mr. Andy Sears, uh, director of water reclamation, has done quite a bit of talking not only with vendors to, s to get their feedback on what the existing market is, but uh, also with our peers who have been in the open market <laughs> trying to come up with these same chemicals. Uh, not only is the challenge the unit price, but the challenge is also the availability. availability. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we feel we wouldn't feel confident. Uh, we wouldn't be bringing this to you if we didn't feel confident that this is uh, uh, our best options of, of the two. Okay, good enough. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Uh, and finally, item G, adoption of general resolution number GR 23-70, a general resolution <clears throat> authorizing the issuance of task order number two for the sanitary sewer manhole rehabilitation annual contract and authorizing the transfer of project funds. Mr. Woody. Uh, an important part of our um, inflow and infiltration program is not only lining sewers, but also doing uh, rehabilitations to manholes, installing liners, doing various repairs uh, to reduce the inflow into uh, manholes. Uh, we have an existing contract with uh, BLD that was approved by the board on August 22nd. Uh, it's a unit price contract, and we uh, then issue a task order with quantities and they conduct that work until the money is exhausted, then we come back to the board and ask for additional funding. So this is a uh, renewal of an existing uh, contract issuance of task order number two. Uh, we're asking for a total of $980,000 this year uh, for this next task order, but uh, we already have some funds uh, that are um, uh, already available, about 410000 so we're only asking for f additional funding in the amount of five hundred and seventy make up the total task order amount of 980000 I see no speakers. No one has questions on this. Um, okay, well, I will entertain a motion for items A through G minus item C. A motion. I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion. Okay. We have a motion by Mr. Stevens and seconded by Ms. Campbell. I have one comment, sure, if I might, mm -hmm. on item A. I would just like to say it's been a huge impro uh, improvement, even with the additional cost this time, and a, a job has been well done by this firm, and not only the firm but our administrator on getting some of these old lawsuits settled and out of the way. Oh yes. I could uh, make a. Yes, sure. Mr. Williams. Thank you. In reference to the. Uh, General Resolution 2365 and 68, if we could just remember to get some feedback, because both, both, both of those general resolutions uses CIP CR 014 uh, Alpha to pay for the, the, the transfer of funds to those new general resolutions. So just uh, what we plan to do for that CIP would be helpful information for me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Williams, and I, I'm sure Mr. Woody will follow up on that. Okay, please vote on items A through G minus C. Mr. Perkins, were is yours frozen up? And Amanda's system had been working so well today. <laughs> <laughs>
And it passes, thank you, it passes 5-0. Okay, now we'll take up item C, uh, a general resolution number GR2366, a general resolution authorizing the accept acceptance of bid and awarding of a contract authorizing the executive director to execute a contract with Chavers Construction Inc. for $1,877,730. Uh, Mr. Woody, if you will um, talk us through this item, please. As presented to you, it is a resolution uh, regarding the acceptance of a bid for the uh, Pensacola Beach reclaimed water main phase 1B part 1 project. You may remember you just uh, voted on the acquisition of pipe for this project. Uh, this resolution is for uh, accepting a bid for construction uh, of this very same project along uh, Vindaluna that would uh, run new pipe for reuse uh, between the Pensacola Beach treatment plant and just across the street from uh, Fort Pickens. A future phase will connect it onto the, to the pipe, onto the uh, uh, tanks. Uh, design for this project was done by Baskerville uh, uh, Donovan, and then we uh, issued a request for competitive bids on April 20th, uh, and we received three bids. Uh, the amounts are shown in the middle of the page, uh, 151. Chavers Construction was the low bid at uh, 1,877,730, and you'll see we received two other bids, one from Pensacola Concrete and one from Talcon Group. Um, at this time, uh, we are recommending award of the contract to Chavers Construction, uh, but we do have uh, two uh, speakers that want to speak on this project. Uh, one is Mr. Ch Chavers from uh, the construction company, and I believe he may have um, uh, council representing him uh, as well. Uh, all contracts uh, that we issue for bids, not just this one, but all contracts, uh, we do require the bidders to submit a bid bond. The purpose of the bid bond is to make sure that our bidders are serious about going forward with contracting. Uh, there is a cost and time associated with uh, preparing this information to bids. And uh, that uh, bid bond provides us assurances that whoever is the named uh, lowest and best bid will enter into a contract with us so we can go forward. If they uh, fail to do so, then they would uh, forfeit their uh, bid bond or alternatively uh, pay a sum uh, to ECUA uh, equal to its value. Uh, the purpose of that, again, is to be sure that we don't uh, have folks that, that uh, bid something uh, low and decide they don't want to bid, and then suddenly we have to, to uh, go out to bids uh, again. Um, Mr. Chavers, however, has identified uh, after we opened the bids uh, that uh, he's concerned about a mathematical error that uh, would create a hardship and has formally asked to withdraw uh, their bids. But because of the requirements that we have that all bidders um, uh, would forfeit a bid, it's our recommendation that we go forward uh, with the recommendation to enter into a contract with Mr. Chambers. Thank you, Mr. Woody. <clears throat> and Mr. Clark, did you want to address this issue. Yes, ma'am. Just to point out to the board, in every bid that goes out, we have a page called Instructions to Bidders, and in that there is a clause that, if, if, if I may read it to the board, it says, any bid may be withdrawn prior to the above scheduled time for the opening of bids or, or authorized postponement thereof. Any bid received after the time and date specified shall not be considered. No bidder may withdraw a bid within 90 days after the actual date of the opening thereof. And as Mr. Woody said, I believe this bid is attempted to be withdrawn after the opening, um, which is when our bid bonds would come into, that's why we require the bid bonds, was for instances like this. Um, and I, sh I think Mr. Woody has covered, as far as the logistics of why we have the bid bonds and why we would, why we try to try to require the bidders to honor those, those bids um, for moving forward, uh, for, for future bids. <coughs> Um, so there is that clause in the instructions to bidders, and they acknowledge that when they submit their bids. Um, that, that's all I have right now. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we will hear from the speakers, and then board members can ask questions. Um, I do not have pink slips. So. You don't fill out pink slips. Okay. <laughs> 
I well, don't know. Well, <laughs> <laughs> You need one from his attorney as well, right? Yes, I, I, if your attorney's going to speak, I will need one from him as well, so. Um, Apologize, let me grab one. Sure. Thank you. Waited all that time. And <laughs> got a technicality. <laughs> uh, if you're going to speak first, Mr. Chavers, you can come forward and uh, your, while your attorney's filling that out. Yeah, I'm going to let Jeremy introduce. I'm going to be here for technical questions okay. and so forth. Okay. Okay, Mr. Brandt, you are recognized. Oh. Brandy. Yeah. Okay. It, B R A N N I N G. Yes. Uh, apologize. Mr. Even though Brandy. the handwriting may look like it's legible, once you try to start to decipher it, it can become uh, <laughs> okay. a, a, a little difficult. Thank you. you. You you're recognized. Thank you, Chair Benson. Uh, members of the board, Chavers Construction. Uh, as we noted some comments earlier. Uh, comes to this board uh, candidly recognizing that it compounded a mistake that was discovered, unfortunately, very late in this process. And the reason that Chavers is here is to request this board to permit it to rescind the bid along with the bid bond due to a discrepancy in the quantity of steel casing that existed in the bid tab versus in the plans for the project. Chavers is here recognizing that it compounded that discrepancy when it failed to realize the difference in the quantity between the amount stated in the bid tab versus what was in the plans. There was even a question and an answer about the discrepancy. And the answer provided was, look at the revised bid plan. It unfortunately contained the same error in the quantity, which Chavers recognizes it should have discovered. But it relied on that quantity when it bid the project. And not only did it rely on that quantity, that quantity would also drive a significant component of the means and methods due to the complexity of the installation of the steel casing involving the additional quantity. Now, as Mr. Chavers mentioned a few moments ago, he's the technical uh, but, you know, but one to address the, the, the issues. However, he asked me to attend on his behalf. One, uh, I'm an attorney with Clark Partington. I've represented Mr. Chavers and his company in you know, various matters to, throughout the years, but I've also been personal friends with Mr. Chavers and Mr. Moylan, the chief operating officer, for, for years. And when they approached me about this matter, they very candidly said, we made a mistake. And they didn't come looking for a way out or an excuse or, or anything other than reflecting on themselves. Jeremy, we've made a mistake and we want to present this to the board to see if there is any relief that can be afforded us in light of our failure to recognize this discrepancy in the quantity of the steel casing between the plans and the revised bid proposal. That's been my experience representing this company and knowing these two gentlemen for years. Uh, they've been very candid. And, and we asked this board to afford them an opportunity to, one, address any questions the board has, but Chavers 
is very concerned about the relationship it has with the ECUA. It did the parking lot for the, for the facility that, that this board just heard the presenters on. It, it's been doing work with ECA for over 15 years. And that's why Mr. Chavers and Mr. Moylan asked me to attend this meeting with them because how important the relationship is with ECUA. And, and the, the driving reasons for making this significant ask is one, preserve the relationship and, and, and be very candid and transparent with, with the board. And, and two, we'd rather get out in front of this now than try to shoehorn being able to do this job into the bid that Chambers submitted. It, it's a situation ripe for conflict later down the line as the project develops. And so Mr. Chavers, in particular, really wanted to see if there's an opportunity to get out in front of this now. Ms. Mr. Branning, may I ask you a quick question? You're, you're saying he's taking responsibility for his mistake, but you're also saying that the document, the bid documents were flawed. Correct. So, so which is it, the, the flawed documents that's the reason? He compounded the mistake that, that, that was in the bid plan documents. He compounded it by not failing, the company compounded it by not failing to realize the discrepancy of the quantity of steel casing in the in the bid tab versus when they measured it on the plans, the correct quantity. Can you tell me what the dollar impact of that discrepancy would be? I do not know that, Chair Benson. Uh, gl glad to see if, if Mr. Chavers or Mr. Moylan could. I, I asked that earlier myself, and I don't think they are capable of answering that question tonight, but I, I, I don't want to prohibit any opportunity for the board to ask them any questions. Okay, let me, I, I sort of jumped ahead and Mr. Stevens has his light on. So Mr. Stevens, let me recognize you. So I'm just trying to get a little clarification. So so it was a mistake on uh, by, by the contractor on, on their tab, on their spreadsheet. It wasn't, it wasn't something, and again, I know mistakes happen. I'm just trying to get a little bit of clarification on on the quantities, was it something that we had submitted on ECUA's end incorrectly with, with quantities, and then he did his proposal based on? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. He, he keyed the, the bid in large part on the quantity that, that's identified in the bid tab, and the plans showed the correct quantity, and he did not, the company did not catch that discrepancy. And the discrepancy in the quantity of the steel casing affects the installation method in a significant. No, I understand. Way. I was yeah, I was just trying to get, trying to get a little clarification. So so there there was so so the the quantity tab did not match the actual quantity in the in the in the in the, in the prints themselves. Correct. So 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 okay. So upon a secondary, tertiary, whatever review, they realized that okay, the quantities that we sent them did not match the actual scope of work on the plans. Candidly, when they realized they were the likely low bidder, they dug into a review, which candidly they do when they are the low bidder on any project. But this certainly jumped off the page uh, in light of what they said. Well, it, it's significant. I mean, if, yes. I mean I'm sure the other, my other members have also looked at the, the, the discrepancies or the disparity, I should say, between Chavers bid and then the other two. I mean, it's 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 pretty significant. I'm sure of them having a ton of parts laying around the yard that they haven't used for years and years, and just you know, even so, that's that's that that, that is significant. So I, I would I would, uh, yeah, that's that's and that's all I have. Uh, Mr. Woody. Um, there's really two things at, at play here. One is the question about this specific project uh, that Mr. Chavers is asking about, but I would ask that you also keep in mind implications to all pro future projects, as well as this one. Um, all bidders have to submit a bid bond. Uh, it's a standard requirement for the reasons we've already discussed. Uh, a contractor pays a premium or fee to a bonding company to provide the, the bid bond. It's a you know, percentage of the value of the, of the project. 
if we were to uh, release Mr. Chambers from uh, this requirement in this instance, I would anticipate that the other two bidders would probably be asking, well, then can I have a refund of the premium I had to pay for my bid bond since you're not requiring it on this project? Um, so there might be a bid challenge there. Uh, also, going forward, uh, how do we address uh, similar complaints by others who may make mistakes? They do happen, certainly. Um, that puts us in an awkward position when we set a precedence for uh, not requiring it in one instance, but requiring it in other instances. So it's consistency with our own documents is important. Thank you, Mr. Woody. Uh, Ms. Campbell. It's very unfortunate, and we see huge gaps sometimes in these, and most of the time it's because somebody doesn't want the job, you know, so they bid it really high. I mean, look at the, look at the difference between the second and third. So, I mean, my only, my only worry is that we set a, a precedent for future with this, and I really do hate it for Mr. Chambers because I know he's done a good job for ECUA in the past. What I, I didn't understand was what you were talking about with problems in the future on this, on this same bid. Mr. Branning, you may address her question. Thank you. Construction projects, particularly one that the contractor Chavers here would go into knowing that it would create a hardship on the company because of the likely inability to actually do the project for the amount of the bid, it, it, it's ripe for conflict due to the inability to do the work for, 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 for what it bid. And so as it would try to you know, navigate areas that may be able to, uh, they may be able to adjust in, in order to, you know, reduce the exposure or the expense here, it, it, it's just ripe for conflict if, if that everything doesn't work seamlessly. And, and it's likely that they would already be forced into a situation of having to do it at a significant loss. So what is the, what is the, the fee for the bond? 93000 that's all I have. May I uh, ask Mr. Palmer some questions? I know Mr. Hayden isn't here, but it, uh, you're you're con you're familiar with this this project and and the the bid documents, I assume. Madam but Chairman, members of the board, yes, there there was a discrepancy between the drawings and the bid tab, and that discrepancy is not, I think, the real issue when we pay a contractor, we pay based on installed linear footage. I think it was 180 versus 220 or something along those lines. One said 180, one said 220. So we would pay for whatever work is done. I, I believe the issue is that this, uh, this installed pipe has to go under some other pipes and I don't believe, uh, my understanding is that is really the issue it has to go deeper and so a lot of dewatering and is that's what I understand the issue is it's not that there's a discrepancy because we would pay on installed uh, materials okay let me let me delve a little bit deeper when when we put out a bid we usually have a number that we think is it, it we have in mind that we think that a project is worth did did the bid come in where we expected it to come in was it particularly low was it the bidding environment right now is very I difficult I to to estimate uh, i believe um it's in the range uh, of where we expected it so uh, you weren't million. shocked when you saw that number and thought oh my i would uh, add projects at the beach are very difficult to estimate again because of just the things that go on out there stock and what the estimate is so just so I understand your answer to that question, the the bid outcome is predicated on a unit price per some distance. Right. So, so the the mistake 
in a way doesn't really matter because you're going to pay per whatever foot or that's uh, correct so the, yeah, the so the fact that there was a discrepancy does not really affect the award of of the the bid because it's going to be whatever it's going to be the, the unit cost you know as long as the unit cost is good then it goes up and down based on the installed quantity okay okay um Thank you, and stay there. There are a couple of other questions, uh, Mr. Palmer, and I don't know the, for whom. Uh, Ms. Campbell. Uh, I, you called on me. Okay, sorry, I didn't throw you in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Stevens, did you have another well, question? Mr. McMahon is gonna be here. Uh, the attorney. Okay. Mr. Branning, you're, he has a question for you. Sure. So Mr. Branning, no, so I'm just tr trying to kind of cut to the chase. So. So bottom line is Shaver's construction underbid the job, accidental, um, whatever the case may be, whether it be some, I guess, some information that we had given or, or a tab. So um, they're, they're questioning whether or not they're going to be able to complete the job for the, for the, uh, for, 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 for the price that they bid. So they're asking us to, to essentially discount that, that, uh, um, that bid and, um, and they're, they're asking to withdraw is that I just want to make sure I'm understanding what they're what, what they're asking us to do up here. Um, I understand there's the bid bond, so they're asking us to withdraw their bid um, due to the fact that they that they made a mistake and mistakes happen. Um, uh, and then um, and, and then what? I guess just. I don't like, know. If yeah, well, I yeah, know if yeah, I'm sorry. Yet. Yes, no, no, yes, no, please. Yes, sure. if you just, just like, yeah. Well, what's I'll, the end Traver, result? Yes. Allow Chambers to rescind the bid okay. and submit it along with the bid bond. Okay. And the, the reason for that, and, and one of, you know, additional representation is, it, you know, if this group is so inclined to, to grant this request, you know, Chambers represents obviously that it, it would not, uh, you know, submit a bid for the project if it were to go out to, to be rebid again, because that, that would be, you know, Obviously, it wouldn't want to do that. But the request is, to answer your question directly, to rescind the bid inclusive of the bid bond. Okay, okay. And then that, and that, would, that would essentially, okay, so they, so they were sent, so we're, 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 and then again, ECUA at that point would be sending this back out to bid. I don't think, I don't know if we had arbitrarily go to bid number, the second lowest bidder, or the third, or the case may be, this would, this would, this would send us back to I guess rebidding the entire project. Can Mr. Woody, can you answer that? Am I able to, <coughs> Madam Chair, kind Mr. of cross Woody. the. <laughs> there. Um, couple, couple of concerns. Uh, you asked about rebidding. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm just asking, so I'm trying to understand the facts. So, so Chavers Construction, as I understand it now, is asking to rescind their bid um, if the board is so inclined. We're speaking hypothetical, so I can kind of get an understanding of this. Um, give them their bid bond back if, 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 that that what would what would that look like? Does, does ECUA send this back out to bid, or do we go with the second bid? If, for example, Chavers can't perform the project for the specified amount, uh, if we were to choose to release all three bidders from their bids and therefore their bid bonds back, and then went out to bid again, uh, it's already almost July. Uh, and the purpose, uh, you remember, we, we bought pipe early so that we could build this project this off construction season. So I would say we would lose this off uh, construction season for tourists and we'd postpone the project by a year. Okay, so, so, so you're, you're saying if, we, if, if they don't perform, then that could possibly set us back? If, if, if they or the second low bidder doesn't perform, we would lose a year. Okay, so, so, so I'm saying the second little bidder, so if they withdraw theirs, we, again, um, from the legalities, we'd, if, if, we, if we allowed them to do that, we'd have to allow all of the other bidders to withdraw their bid bonds, which I'm assuming they, 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 were, they were the low bidder, so their, their bid bonds have already been re returned to them, the other two? Or th that's not a... That's not a mm, no. Um, when they submit their bid packages, they, they attach a bid bond. They've paid a premium to a bonding company mm -hmm. Uh, for the face value of the bond, like insurance, you sure. pay a premium yeah, for, for that. And um, then once we enter into a contract with the lowest and best bid, 
then the uh, other bidders, however many there are, they get their bid bonds back. And um, uh, because we were able to encumber a contract with the low bidder. Uh, that's the reason that we have uh, bid bonds. Uh, otherwise, we would have lots and lots of, uh, of uh, low bidders that might walk away if they see a big gap between them and the second low bidder or decide for whatever reason they got too busy. And you know, we've invested 30, 60 days in, in advertising and, and um, um, pre-bid pre meetings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, only to have bidders walk away from the table, uh, we would really be hard to get work done. Yeah, so our option would be to, so if our option was, we, we, we're not, there's not a guarantee that the second bidder would, well, I'm assuming they would, but we don't, we, we don't know that. So we were, we're, we'd have to reach back out. Um, and, and then the other option, the other, for, for, you know, for you is, you're, 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 I know you're, you're kind of on the fence and, and kind of speaking in vague generalities and you know perhaps whether you can perform or not perform or it would cause a financial hardship which as a small business owner I can completely relate to um, um, but uh, if if they if you don't get your request is it you your clients um, intent to do the job anyway or is it to forfeit the bond I don't know the answer to that can, it, can I Ask that Mr. Chavers address that. Mr. Chavers, you're recognized. Yeah, thank you. Um, at, at this point, we would move forward with, with the job and do the job. Um, just to speak on the unit quantities and, and how those are added, um, the one thing I would like to say is as a unit quantity for certain items are increased, the difficulty of that task is also increased. With things like bores and so forth, you know, you have to have certain machinery if you want to go 50 feet, certain machinery if you want to go 500 and et cetera. And, and it created a, a way of looking at the project that was different. Now, I'm definitely going to say that it is all my fault because we should have measured, you know, but also at the same time, the, uh, the, the big quantity unit sheet was a revised unit sheet and in the questions and answers it says here see the new unit sheet because the revision is, is, is we assume that was saying here's the new one is correct and, and that's just something that we feel like down the road as we're trying to negotiate with staff is we're, as we're trying to make that point to staff when we're out there in the field and we're trying to say hey look we, we understand that you're just adding 40 feet but we would like you to understand that this is how things are done. And I know everybody wants to run from means and methods, but means and methods are the definition of different projects. You know, you do a, you do a bore underneath Mobile Bay, you've got to have a certain machine to do it. You do one underneath uh, one of these streets out here, it's different. So that right there would create a bunch of conditions that would put us in an adversarial position with the ECUA staff that we've worked so well with all these years. And for us to say, hey man, how about you know, we, we've got an issue, please forgive us, we, we'd like to do that. But we, we have ground, so I understand precedence. I understand precedence is very important because once you set that and allow somebody to come up here and plead their case and you start that, then, you, then, you, then now you have precedence. But this actually has some grounds and errors that we understand we're responsible for checking. But given it was in an addendum, given we had questions and answers that, 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 that said, yes, here it is, given those things, we made a mistake, and that is what we're asking for is grace for that mistake. Um, like, like Jeremy had mentioned, we have done a lot with ECUA. We did build the parking lot that you guys are fixing to put the recycling or the transfer facility at, and that, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that project went really well, and so has many other projects. And um, that's pretty much all of it, though. You know, so it is a mistake. Yes, if you guys say, hey, we're going to give it, we, we're not going to walk on the bond. We, we, have a, we have a relationship with our bonding company as well that, uh, you know, we're, we're bonding every week or every month. Uh, I will say this, you know, bid bonds are free. They're, they're free. They, they, the, binding co the, the bond company sends you free bid bonds because of the, the, the patronage that you give to them. So all of our bid bonds are free. Now, when they're called upon, then they're 82, 92, 100, whatever thousand dollars that it is when, you, when you're called <coughs> upon them. But that right there is kind of where we're at, uh, board. Um, we do appreciate uh, your attention. 
Thank you. Mr. Shavers, you know, we, <clears throat> we do a lot of bids. And, and there's some people who come and win bids that we all think, oh, <laughs> you're not one of those. We value the relationship we, we have with you, and you do good work, and you have a good reputation in the community and, and with our staff. I can't get beyond the precedent that we would be setting to people just like you if, if we allowed someone to, to win a bid and then back out and lose the bond. I think the damage to our credibility as a utility would be huge. And if you were one of the other players, I think you would feel that way as well. This board likes to pe please people who come before us and ask us for something. And, and, and it's hard to say, no, we've got to play by these rules because ultimately we're measured by the integrity of our bid process. And, and so I, as one board member, you've got four other shots at this, uh, cannot, cannot move forward with, with allowing you out and allowing you out of the bid bond. Not that it's personal, but our integrity, I think, is, is so critical. Um, and I'm sorry to say that. It's, Understood. it's hard. Cause, cause because bids are inanimate objects and you're a human being. And so it's, it's hard to say, so say no to your face. Uh, Ms. Campbell. I echo, I echo uh, Ms. Benson's words and I really like you and I feel really bad for you with what's going on right now. Um, the thing that bothers me the most is I see the big difference between two and three. And if we go back out to bid, Two's liable to come back and say, well, I really can't do this, for, you know, and, and it'd be like the same difference. Um, plus the time that it would take and whatever and the precedent it would set. And I, I truly am sorry, Mr. Chambers, that we that I can't vote for you today because I believe that you're a good man. I believe that you made an honest mistake. It's just I, I can't set that precedent. But thank you for coming today. Ms. Campbell, Mr. Williams. Mr. Chavers, I didn't know you before you came in here today, but your presentation of being honest uh, solidified the fact that I think you're honorable, and I would I would want you to leave here with that same integrity as you would think about us. You know, we have, on the other side, have that, that same honor of trying to do business fairly across the board with everybody that we do business with. And so uh, I have respect for you in, in that era. Um, I'm hoping that you'll do your best job in spite of the fact that it may cost you because that's the way you presented yourself here today. And uh, I'm, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure, that you'll get other contracts with ECUA as well as with the Scampi County and other places that you do business with. So, you know, as business goes, sometimes we have to um, not make as much as we would hope, but I, I really do appreciate your presentation of, of owning it. I do. And I want to say thank you for that. You're finished. Okay. You wanted to speak again? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and this is something I, I, I kind of struggle with too because I, I work in the construction industry as well in part. So, so I understand, you know, like I said, mistakes happen. I also understand precedents and, and, and so forth and, and everything that, that Chair, Chairwoman Benson, you know, had, had echoed. I do struggle a little bit with with um, on, on, on one side, you, we inadvertently, it, it appears, gave you some incorrect information from which you derived your bid from. On the other hand, you know, it is incumbent upon all contractor developers to, to check and recheck because, you know, to err is human, uh, as, as it were. So I, 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 I struggle with both this. I, if it was, if it was, cut and dry and black and white and hey look you know you, you the information was there it was correct 
the, the quantities matched uh, the scope of work, matched the architectural drawings, the schematics. You just missed it. That's on you. Um, it, you know, my decision would be a little bit easier um, uh, to, 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 to make at least, you know, at least for, 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 for or, you know, my responsibility uh, and so forth. So that's the only thing that I, I, I struggle with is, uh, is it's still ultimately the responsibility of the contractor to review and double check and recheck. But at the same time, we inadvertently um, uh, sent you some information that, um, that probably our staff um, may or may not have checked uh, or something got missed as I have understand the facts as they've been presented is that the quantities did in fact not match the actual drawing so I don't want to beat the proverbial dead horse uh, on that but it, um, I, I do get I do get precedence but I'm not sure you know what what if any responsibility we would have I guess there's no legal responsibilities but what, what responsibility we would have to say hey look you know, yes, one one format did not match the other format. However, you should have checked uh, and measured on your own. So um, that's kind of what I'm struggling with um, right now, as opposed to everything was sent to you correctly from 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 our department. You just missed it. Well, that's on you. Um, so anyway, I just to add those two cents. Did you have something more you want to say? Just one follow up question. Sure. Mr. Chavis, had, have you done have you done jobs at the beach prior to this one? Uh, yes, sir. We did all the crossings for um, Excambia County probably about seven years ago. Cooper was the project manager, and we did stormwater uh, crossings uh, for Excambia County across Via de Luna. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Yep. I have no more speakers. Um, I will entertain a motion regarding item C. Um, I have a motion by Mr. Perkins, seconded by Ms. Campbell. And is your motion, did you want to state your motion, Mr. Perkins? Staff recommendation. For the staff recommendation. It's been but, moved, uh, moved and I would, seconded. I would like to say something on yes, it. I, please know, do. I, I feel really bad because it is, it is an unfortunate situation and I have to weigh the totality of it and, and and it's like when mr clark read off you know the requirements that that bidders may be withdrawn prior to the opening but no bid may be withdrawn 90 days after and uh you know that everybody had to follow those rules all the other contractors and everything and so it's kind of like after the game's over we want to go back and have a redo and it, it's just it would be it just wouldn't be right for us you know as an organization to do that it wouldn't be right to the other bidders and i've seen a lot of government entities where there's allegations of bid rigging and stuff like that and ours has always been real above board i've never ever seen a problem with anything like that in ecua and i and, and so to me it's paramount um to keep it like that you know and then the, the flip side is is that You've been a good contractor for us. Contractors are not easy to come by. You've done very well for 15 years. We haven't ever had any conflict that I that I can remember. So I really feel bad about this situation. And, and in my opinion, if there were unforeseen things that came up on a project on the project, legitimate things, not not makeup, not making up any money, you know, but legitimate issues. That were raised that said we need a, a change order because of this and it was a legitimate you know issue i would i would look at that probably favorably and, and see if there's any relief that can be provided there but but i just cannot go into um redoing or undoing the bids and giving and giving the bid bond back because it's just everybody's got to play by the same rules and if we give one person special treatment then next time you know everybody's gonna say hey where, where's my special treatment you know so it, it, it's nice to have you here, and like Mr. Williams said, you're obviously an honorable man, um, and I and I hope that you know the project goes better than anticipated. I'm sorry that you're in this situation. Thank you, and uh, we are prepared to vote. I don't see any other lights on, so please vote. And it passes five to five. Mr. Chavers, thank you thank, for thank you. coming today. Thank you, and, ladies and gentlemen. And I hope we'll see you again on, on yes. some great bids. You will. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, that concludes our, the items on our consent agenda and other agenda. Um, you have the budget report. Uh, I don't see Mr. Smith here today, so I assume you have reviewed the budget report. We'll go to the executive director's report. Mr. Woody, you're recognized. Yeah. Um, Ms. Our fine instructor, Mr. Smith, is attending a GFOA conference in, um, in uh, Orlando this week. Uh, I have three things I want to touch on. Uh, one, if you've been uh, following the news, you may have seen, and I mentioned it in a board report as well, and I mentioned it in a, in a board report as well, the Florida retirement system has changed uh, due to some legislation passed uh, this past season uh, by our rep representatives and senators, uh, and it involves increasing a feature of the Florida retirement system referred to as DROP. Uh, it's an opportunity for um, um, public employees who are in the Florida retirement system to uh, receive an earlier disbursement just uh, up to five years prior to uh, their retirement and then uh, continue to work for the entity uh, for those remaining five years. Uh, that uh, benefit has uh, been extended by the leg state legislature to eight years total now. Uh, it's a very nice benefit for our employees. Um, however, it was done by the state legislature. We weren't involved, asked, or otherwise uh, consulted as the same for all the other uh, public employers across the state. Uh, the impact to us based on a revised actual report and therefore revised contribution rates uh, will be $637,000 next year. So all benefits do come at a cost. Unfunded mandates. <laughs> <laughs> one, way, one way to refer to it. Uh, right now, just uh, for your general information, we have about 35 employees out of 630 who are in the current uh, DROP program. Uh, They're still reaching out to our HR department to indicate whether they want to take advantage of this or, or not. We believe about 11 are. Uh, so far, there may be others. Uh, second item, uh, we did have a meeting last week regarding the subject of cross connections. Uh, periodically, I add information in the board report about updates and correspondence we ha have with the Florida Department of um, Environmental Protection uh, on the subject. This is a policy and program of the FDEP uh, that requires you, public and private water utilities to um, have additional protections for their uh, water utilities by having certain classes and certain conditions of, uh, of connections to the system to be protected by um, backflow devices. Or other, there's other different types depending on the, uh, whether you're commercial, residential, etc. <clears throat> we have full compliance with all of our commercial connect connections. Um, and we've got very good compliance uh, among most of our connections in the residential side associated with uh, private wells. Uh, we do have some issues with uh, folks who are connected uh, with irrigation, who have irrigation systems and have to have um, uh, separate uh, backflow prevention devices. Uh, we have an enforcement program, but we have not taken it to the 11th step of um, threatening and going through with uh, disconnection of services for not installing a, a backflow prevention device. Um, while we, our rate of compliance has been slowly increasing over the years, uh, we still have thousands, a uh, few thousand folks who aren't quite there at that um, full compliance state. So um, we're at a point now where we might possibly be subject to a uh, consent order if we don't uh, take this yet a step further. So we'll be working on some recommendations to make to our, and some questions to ask to our legal department about our options going forward. Uh, but the subject will undoubtedly come back to the board in coming months. Uh, lastly, you may have seen quite a bit of correspondence or quite a bit of media coverage with the uh, subject of PFAS litigation. Uh, th the 3M Corporation did enter into a settlement with the uh, bellwether uh, city that uh, we were at one point in time um, uh, potentially going to be a bell bellwether um, uh, plaintiff uh, in the case. 
settlement is upwards of about $12 billion with a B. Uh, it'll be months before you really know what fraction of that will trickle down to the members of the class uh, after various categories of funding are set aside for, um, for, for everything from the uh, attorney who won the case, <laughs> who takes their slice right off the top, uh, but there's also different categories for future expenditures and future operations and, uh, and et cetera. So uh, while that's going on in the background, uh, there are still many other um, defendants on that case, and uh, we'll be discussing in the future whether we would want to uh, potentially pursue our case with uh, other uh, defendants uh, other than 3M. So we may have some discussions with you uh, in the not too distant future about that. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Woody. Um, Mr. Clark. Thank you, Ms. Vincent. Uh, as Mr. Woody said, we had our call yesterday, yesterday with the with our attorneys on the 3M case, and we talked about the settlement with 3M. Um, we talked about the settlement with DuPont, and they told us that's about <coughs> there's about 17 percent uh, liability out there remaining with the other remaining defendants. And so the city of Stewart was the bellwether plaintiff that was chosen instead of us during the last round. Um, they've now asked us to consider what, um, if ECUA would be willing to be a bellwether plaintiff for the remaining 17% of the defendants that still remain. Um, so that's something, an analysis that we'll go over with staff as far as the cost-benefit analysis moving forward. But it, it, it's interesting that they've asked ECUA to, to look into that. That's great. Mr. Perkins. Well, sh should that be an indicator that we can expect a, a pretty decent chunk from this settlement? Yeah, this was what they told us on our call was around 80 or so percent of what they perceived as the total liability for this lawsuit among all of the defendants. So this will be the, the biggest payout, the biggest settlement that will come from this lawsuit. Yeah, but what I'm what I'm concerned about is ECUA. Are we are we going to get a pretty decent chunk of I know we're not going to get billions or anything like that. And there's a lot of other defendants, but them wanting us as a bellwether, is it pretty, are we in a pretty strong position to collect on what we've had to expend? At least some of it to, uh, to correct this problem. What we talked about was that there is a proverbial pot of damages, and one of them will be for expenditures prior to the filing of that lawsuit. So, and we have our GAC filters, and we've expended a lot of funds on those. So we do, we will have, we will have us our stake in that pot as well, as well as our future damages. And that that concludes my report. Thank you, sir. Um, we have. No, no one has raised something under unfinished business or new business. Oh, sorry. Speak, please. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, does anyone have anything under board communications? Uh, we come to our second open forum, and I have no more pink slips. Good meeting, team. We are adjourned. Tried. You tried I know. I worked on that. <laughs>